Okay, good morning. Uh, I see you may have lost your people from yesterday dinner. Maybe they will come a little later. So the most, the strongest one is still here, which is good. So let's start. And I remind you that I can see that uh, when the attractor is uniformly hyperbolic plus time. So now I would like to relax conditions of hyperbolicity so they will be, it will be non-uniformly hyperbolic. Usually non-uniform hyperbolicity is stated in the way by requirement that the of exponents are non-zero. In particular, it means that if I have a point x and vector v, I can define the Lapham of exponent of that sphere. I remind you that this is an upper limit and infinity 1 over n of And that that number exists regardless of the choice of x and v, because it's an upper limit. So for each x and for each vector v, I have Lapham of exponent. As we discussed, this function of, as a function of v takes finitely many quantities. So I can assume that uh, those one, no, none of those values is z. And that's how I can say that I have a non zero exponent. The question is for what x? If I require that this is true for every x in that, then in fact one can prove that in this case that vector is uniform. I mean, under mild additional assumption, it's essential that the attractor is uniform. So it, 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 if I want to get to move away from uniform hyperbolic, I have to relax this condition, meaning that it's not for all x, but somehow for almost all x. Now what almost all means, I don't have any measure, and my goal is to construct an SRP measure. So if I don't have any measure, how would I say that my the system has non-zero exponent in a reasonable sense. Now, if I just consider upper limits, uh, consider take a point for which Lapinov exponent not non-zero, in, in that definition when I take the upper limit, it's not at all clear how to construct stable and unstable local money. Construction of those manifolds require much more it's true for almost all points with respect to any measure, not for all. So when I have a point and I don't have a measure, I don't know if along the trajectory of this point I can construct stable and unstable manifold. So if I don't have unstable manifold, I don't have SRD measures because the definition based on presence of unstable manifolds. So this is kind of a puzzling situation. That's why there is no accepted notion of non-uniform hyperbolic effect. Uh, so we have to work around that in certain sense. The way to work around that is the following. Since we don't have any invariant measure, we have to deal with what we have. And this is the big measure. The big measure is only natural measure present in this situation. Right. But the big measure 
This respect to Lebesgue measure, the attractor has zero measure. So Lebesgue measure does not see the attractor. So what does it see is a neighborhood. So the idea is to work with points in the neighborhood of the attractor, which have positively bad measure. Although the bad measure is not invariant, but the idea is to impose conditions on, a, on, a, on, on points in outside of the attractor, not inside. Such that the, this condition holds for a set of points of positive volume. And out of this condition, construct a measure on a tractor, which is an SRB measure. So that's ba basically the way to kind of proceed with non-uniform kind of publicity in the case of attractors. And so I would like to go along this way. And what I would like to do is I would like to introduce such a number of conditions. The first condition. It is the following requirement. There exists a set A in U such that, such that for every X in A, we can construct two codes, K as X, which I write as K as X, B e as X. And alpha S X. And the cone K U X, which is a cone K U X, E U X, alpha U X. So what this means is a problem. that you have a cone, it's a kind of a, a circular cone. So it has a center subspace, which is ES, and an angle, which is alpha S, for the cone K S, and respectively EU and alpha U for the cone K. So I assume that there are two cones. Each cone is defined by ES and EU as a set. And, and those uh, subspaces are just centers of the cone. Yeah. I'll pay the fee. The notation, maybe I should maybe what I do is, I'm, I'm sorry, I would write this and this. Stressing that these are not necessarily stable and unstable local, uh, you know, stable and unstable subspaces, which we had before. So these are just subspaces which are centers of the form, nothing else. And what I assume is that those, those cones are, are in there. So if I take T F applied to the cone, and takes a closure, then applies its own KU at FX. And if I take DF, apply to the cone KSX, DF minus one, the inverse, takes a closure, it applies to FX. F minus one. And naturally, I would assume that so that's the first condition and the condition B is that E S X so it takes a direct sum of E S X and E U X then I get the tensions the whole so the cones are transposed in that sense And, uh, and I assume that if you consider the dimension of ESX, called DS, and the dimension of EUX, called DU, then these are constant independent objects. So the dimensions of those subspaces is fixed. The, ma the matter is that. If it's not, you can always consider a subset on which it is that constant. It's only fine if you make the boundaries that take it. So, and then restrict yourself to this. 
So this is not really a tweak. Okay, so that's connection of the two points, which are defined on the some sense, so we have to think of, of neighborhood U. This is an attractor. Now, this is to get after this procedure. Somewhere out, outside London, there is a set A. For which you have this, this point. So it does not have to occupy the whole U, just, just the subset. And this, I mean, later on, I would require that this subset is test positive work. So it's not a few points. But at the moment, it's just a subset. Now, I will not require that those cones depend continuously from the point. And in fact, they do not have to. So it's a measurable, you can always assume parallel measurable uh, uh, collection of cones. Yes? Why do you consider the kilometer? Say, no, no. Why do you consider the kilometer there with uh, K is uh, I mean, so what do you consider the kilometer with uh, I mean, it's the first condition. I think. Yeah. You mean this? Yeah, yeah. why do you call the kilometer? Yeah, why do you take the closure of the cone instead of just Why do I take the closure of the cone? Because the, uh, it, it's a question of how we define the cone. My cone is an open set. So the boundary of the cone is not included. So when you take the image, you know, I want it to be strictly inside. That's I think the main point is that it should be strictly inside, not yes. equal to the cone. It be yeah, you can include the boundary if you want, but still you want the image of the cone to be strictly inside. But you do not say how, how much inside. There is no estimate on how they should. They may be very close to the boundary of the cone. And there's no control, at least at this point. But it is its, And that's important. I don't understand why this is the SMP or what are the two sets? How do you treat them? This one? No, no, no. This one? No, no, no. The second one, yeah. This? Yeah, it is. So basically what it says, you have a point X, and the point X, somehow there is two subspaces, E, U, E, S, and there's a cone around E, U, there's a cone around E, S, of angle alpha U, alpha S. Now, I claim there exists a two cones. I don't want to tell you how I built them. I just say there are two cones. They came from who knows where. <laughs> okay. Now, in fact, I, okay, since you asked the question, I would like, I, I was going to say it a little later, but maybe I say it right now. If you have, if you assume that your attractor lambda is uniform, Then, by the definition of uniform hyperbolicity, you have stable and unstable directions, etc. Right? So, what you always can do is you take a point X. At this point, you have E S, and now S is a superscript because it's a stable direction, and E U. And what you can do is the following: you can always produce a cone around this is x, of a certain angle alpha, which in this case is a constant, regardless of x. So around each of the stable and unstable direction, you can construct a cone of some, maybe small, but certain angle, such that those cones will satisfy this problem. So if you have it, but this will be on the set, on the attractor layer. Now, because the stable and unstable subspaces depend continuously on facts, those cones will depend continuously on facts. And therefore, you can extend them to a small neighborhood 
of, of a threat, right? And because the contraction here is uh, with the closures, and the angle is fi fixed angle, you have fixed contraction and expansion rates, in fact, every cone will shrink at, by a certain amount. So when you expand, extend to the neighborhood, they also will shrink. Like lesser amount, but will shrink. So when you extend, the corresponding centrals of the cones are no longer invariant in the neighborhood. They are invariant on the attractor, but it, it, when you extend it to the neighborhood, to some neighborhood, they're not necessarily invariant. But the cones will be invariant in this sense, in a small way. So that's, in the case of uniformly hyperbolic attractors, you always have these cones, which satisfy this property. And in fact, the set A is just a subset, open subset, an open neighborhood of the attractor, lying in you. So in the case of uniform hyperbolic attractors, those, can, those cones can be easily chosen, and they will satisfy this property. Huh? Now, so that's one condition. Then there is another condition, which has an interesting name, EH1. Of course, it means that there will be EH2. Uh, and I do not tell you what EH means at the moment, but I will. Uh, the condition is the following. So if I have these two cones, then I can compute the two numbers, lambda s, x. So I fix x in, in u, in a, I'm sorry, in this a, where I have my coins. And I compute the number lambda s, u, which is a supreme of log of norm df v. V belongs to KS. X norm V is equal to 1. And lambda U, so I put U here, it, uh, maybe, maybe I have lambda UX, which is infinite log norm DF. V, V belongs to KUX. Now, what are they? What are these numbers? This number is, so this number is, you look at the, the when you take a vector v, you only deal with vectors of unit lengths, that's sufficient. You choose a vector v in the stable pole, you apply dfv. So you consider how Differential acts on vectors in the stable pole. Now, I said the stable pole, I expect somehow that things will contract. And then I am, if I choose that kind of a reasonable way, then I expect in the stable pole vectors to contract, and in an unstable pole vectors to expect. So if I apply df to v, then the length of this vector gets smaller than the length of the vector v. And since the length of the vector v was 1, this number will be less than 1. Then I take log, I get a negative number. So I expect this number to be negative. And respectively, I expect this number to be positive. So what is this? This is the biggest contra possible contraction in the stable form. And this is the smallest expansion in the unstable. Okay? So if I if I chose my stable and unstable cone correctly, this is what I would get. This number would be the strongest contraction, this will be the uh, smallest expansion, biggest expansion. However, my, my cones are not necessarily stable and unstable cones. I, I mean, I, I don't know how to choose them this way, right? I just choose two sets of cones. So in fact, 
for a given point x, it very well may be that this is positive and this is negative. Okay? So I don't even, I mean, I call them stable and unstable. But I don't know how actually my differential acts in this course. So I may get a negative number, I may get a positive number. So I don't really know. So I should produce a way to control that. The way to control that is to introduce a number called delta x, which is equal to 1 over alpha maximum zero lambda s x minus lambda u x. And it's called the fact from the negation. Now what is that? The idea is the following. If indeed I have this number negative and this one number positive, then lambda s is negative, this is positive, this is negative number, the defect is zero. So no defect. So when the situation is as, as, as expected, then there's no defect. However, if in fact here I have expansion and here I have contraction, then defect, you would still uh, you know, you may have contraction, expansion here, you may also have expansion here. So it's a, it's a situation where you don't know anything about actual action of the differential, right? So some, here, some may uh, contract, some may expand. So, I mean, the map can do whatever it wants, in a sense, right? So the, the defect measures how far uh, the action with respect to, of the differential with respect to these two poles differs from what we expect. Now it's interesting that there is a number alpha which is here. That's the further exponent of the map. Which means that if the map is, say, C2, which is nice, this, alpha is 1, you can get rid of it. Or if alpha is, uh, uh, if the map is C100, then alpha is uh, I mean, it's, it only makes it better. But if alpha comes close to zero, which means that the map getting less and less differentiable, close to C1, then the fact may blow up just because of not sufficient further exponent. It increases the fact. So the fact depends on two parameters. One is further exponent, which makes it worse and worse when alpha goes to uh, zero and the, uh, uh, the non-compliance of cones to what I expect them to be, in a sense. And it's called defect from domination because in the normal situation when this is negative and this is positive, you can say that the unstable cone dominates the stable cone. So that's called domination. And the fact measures how much the situation differs from normal domination. So that's this guy. Now, I would like to stress that when you have, let, let's consider the picture which is this, is just, just hyperbolic fixed. And you draw, so there is a contraction, there's, I'm sorry, say expansion in this direction with lambda and contraction with okay. Just a hyperbolic fixed point. And then you have a curve. You choose a curve, which is tangent, smooth, nice curve, defined on some, some neighborhood of zero. And you apply the map, the differential. What would happen to the map, uh, to the curve? Well, it expands in this direction. Right? contract here. So what you get is another curve, which is long, goes like that, and like that, right? So it's kind of a, you can consider this curve as an approximation to the actual stable manifold, which is just a piece of, of straight line. And so if you apply the map, you get a better approximation. You move on and on, and the 
you have contracts to the horizontal. So that's how we can determine the stable log group. Now, assume that in this direction, I have actually contraction. And in this direction, I have actually expansion. But my curve is still horizontal. And I still move forward. OK? So I'm doing strange thing. You can always ask why I'm doing that. And my answer is, wait a minute. <laughs> I will answer. So what would happen to this curve? Well, it's going to go like this. It's going to be like that. So the curvature of this curve gets worse. It increases. In the normal situation, the curvature goes to zero. In the situation which is not normal, the curvature actually gets bigger. And the curve will shrink in a sense. Right? So the size where, I mean, if I continue doing that, what you may see is a picture of this time. The curve can actually be something like that. I mean, in a linear case, it does not happen, but if you add a small linear, nonlinear perturbation, the curve can actually bend and, you know. So in order to kind of have a nice curve, you might have to cut it substantially. So it will still be kind of a graph of some nice function, but the curvature of this will drop. That's kind of an obvious picture when you have a linear uh, map. Right? I didn't tell you anything uh, seriously new, right? You just may, may not think it, may not have thought in this way, but there's nothing interesting, nothing different. But the reason I mentioned that is the following. That in a normal situation when you have contraction, a negative uh, lambda s and positive lambda o, that corresponds to and expansion in this in that direction, contraction in this direction. And if I choose a curve, which in the future will be kind of an approximation of my future unstable and unstable manifolds, then if the cones are chosen correctly and I apply my map, I will have a better approximation to the stable and unstable curve, which I don't have at the moment, but I kind of want to construct. But if there is a defect, and the picture is actually opposite. What would happen to my curve that I choose, it will bend. And I will have to cut it, and the curve should grow. Now, how much it grows? The defect actually gives you information on the curvature. So it's interesting. That means the curvature of a curve is not a linear object. It means it's a, you have to, I mean, it depends on derivative, higher order derivatives, etc. Et so, but these guys are linear, I mean, you look at the linear action, at the differential. So, looking at the differential, which only tells you about contraction and expansion, but making a combination of this type of producing the defect allows you, in a sense, to characterize how the curvature of the curve changes when you move forward. And that's what you have to understand. And if the uh, cones are kind of, if the defect is zero, the cones are normal, the curvature decreases when we move forward. And if it's not the case, that it actually increases. So the curve gets worse. That's a picture that you have to have in mind in the future discussions. OK, so that's the meaning of, the, of this defect. OK. Then, my first condition is, so now I produce a number, lambda x, which is minimum of lambda ux minus delta x and minus lambda s. So this is called effective, effective expansion, uh, expansion. Right. So what it tells you is that you have, 
I mean, if, the, if this is zero, no defect, then this will be lambda U S minus lambda S. So it tells you what is the biggest possible expansion. It measures contraction and expansion chooses the biggest one. But if there is a defect, you have to con correct this by defect and then measure it against minus lambda. And the first condition, which is EH1, is that the lean inf n goes to infinity, 1 over n sum lambda f kx, k from 0 to n minus 1, is positive. means that uh, asymptotically there is no defect because this will now the UX dominates I mean the defect is present that it very well may be that uh, lambda U is dominated by lambda S so between the two lambda S becomes minus lambda S becomes one so if you have a strong defect, then it reduces lambda us, so the maximum will be minus lambda s. So you are on an unstable cone, but the effective expansion is given by the stable cone. So you will be wrong by saying that this is an unstable cone. It actually is not an unstable cone, effectively. But if this condition holds that it says that asymptotically, the cone that you call unstable is an unstable cone. And the cone that you call uh, stable is a stable cone. So asymptotically, it's a correct choice of the, of the two cones. And then there is another condition, the second one, the last one, which I call E. H2. And this condition says that now uh, there is one, one more parameter that characterizes codes, which is the angle it fits. Okay. So I introduce the angle say at x, which is infinite of the angle V W, where V belongs to K S X, and W belongs to K U X. So roughly speaking, you should choose the boundary of the two poles and measure the angle between vectors on the boundary. Because if you go in, in the interior, the angle will be bigger. So you take infinite, so it's not. So, so effectively, you just take two cones and another one, and you just measure this. That's the same x. Now, if I have a set gamma in n, n are natural numbers. Assume that I have just a sequence of, of nature and stored again. Right? I define the notion of the density of the, which is lean soup, lean soup, and goes to infinity of uh, 1 over n. Interval from zero to n measure compute how many points in gamma lies in zero n divide by n and take the lips. That's called upper asymptotic density. density. 
And you can obviously put in fin here and get lower And this is just a standard. So it just tells you that, I mean, it's a, for example, if the uh, density, lower density is positive, then uh, you have enough points in the, in the subsequence. It's kind of a positive measure in a sense. So it's, it's not a rare collection of numbers. <coughs> so this is the condition EH2 says that I take the upper density of the set N. So this is a collection of points N for each for which the angle theta at fnx less than some number theta bar. So what happened? I fit some number theta bar, which I call a threshold. Right? And I take the word point x, and I consider forward trajectory of x, f and x. And I look at those moments of time when this angle fall, when the angle falls below the threshold. So the angle becomes smaller. And when I have a trajectory, what happens? You have two cones, and they can be far away, but then can become close, far away close. So you choose a threshold, whatever you want, some small number. And then you find those ends for which this, uh, this uh, angle is below the threshold. So the angle becomes too small compared to my threshold. Okay? And then you compute the frequency upper density of this uh, set of those ends. But this upper density depends on set. Therefore, I take the limit when say to those who say the buttons, say the buttons. And my requirement is that this is equal to zero. But if I compute that limit, so I take smaller and smaller threshold. My threshold goes to zero. Every time I compute the density of those ends when it falls below the threshold, the angle is too small. Well, those numbers appear have certain density. If they appear very rare, the density is zero. That's what I want. I want this bad situation when the angle is too small to be happening very rare. Very rarely means that the density must be zero. May not be zero for each threshold, but it should go to zero when threshold goes to zero. So that's it. That's the second. So when I have the two conditions EH1 and EH2, I say that uh, F is effectively, effectively hyperbolic. And this is EH, effectively. So it's a no, no, new notion of hyperbolicity, which is called effective hyperbolicity. And it's defined in this way. And it's designed in a situation where there is no invariant measures, unlike uh, non-uniform hyperbolicity, uh, you know, which requires certain. It's a, it's a weaker notion than uniform hyperbolicity, but it's different than non-uniform, because there is no measure. And it's clear to see, and it's an easy exercise, that if you consider a uniformly hyperbolic attractor, ex construct cones and expand them to the neighborhood, you can verify that the two conditions hold. That's almost a trivial uh, fact. So the case of uniformly hyperbolic attractors is covered. But it's a much more general situation, yes. Is this It's effective hyperbolicity means that you have a map F, you have these settings, there exists a set A of positive volume for which you have EH1, EH2. So there exists a set A, the cones, 
Sat Z you have VH1 and VH. You have to choose those. Yeah, there exists this uh, code, the codes, you say codes. Uh, once you say codes, you have the center directions of these codes, yes. The question is how do you check these conditions? So that's, of course, an important question. But the same is true how do you check that the, uh, uh, an attractor is uniform in hyperbole? You have to construct the as and the So it's the same story. In fact, we define these conditions. It's, it's actually easier <laughs> than we define conditions of uniform. There are many more attractors which are effectively hyperbolic than attractors which are uniform. So, that's so. state the main scene. There is a main scene. Assume that, so see, it's a joint work of Klein and Harder. So what it says that, assume that, assume that there exists a set S in A such that first, so the big measure, the volume of S is possible. Every x, the second, every x in s is effectively hyperbolic. So it satisfies condition EH1 and EH2. So that's two assumptions. Then there exists an s on the measure. I'm not saying it's unique, I'm just saying there exists an S and D measure In principle, there may be countably many such. You know that there are 
that cannot be more than comfortable because of the SRD property. In principle, this theorem does not prohibit to have many more, in principle, countably many uh, SRD pressures. But it claims that there is at least one. So that's a secret. I would like to re uh, produce a little bit different version of this. The different version is a that. So what you have? You have a neighborhood, you have an attractor, and you have a set A, whatever it is, and inside you have a set S. And S has positive. Not only A has positive, but S has So what I do, I take a point X in S. And I consider the local manifold W. So this is the local manifold through X. So we have a point X. Okay. I don't assume it to be part of any relation to any poles or anything. Just a local mind. You have to choose an appropriate dimension. The, the, the dimension of dimension of W should be Remember, this constant T used. Then my, requir my uh, requirement is that the measure event leave volume on W of the set of points X, which belongs to S intersect with W. So the points X which belongs to W, for which the tension at X to W lies in the unstable form. So in other words, uh, maybe, maybe I should put Y here. So I consider all points Y here such that the tension lies in the unstable cone. And this is the tension. If you look at those, okay? Is that your defined method? No, 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 no. So there, there's no uh, requirement here. It's just a picture. I said I take W and I look at all the points. Why with this property? It may be anti -set. I don't know. So this segment may be empty. My requirement is that if you take the leave volume of this set, then it's positive. Okay? So instead of requirement that the set S has positive volume, I require that there is a W on which the leave volume of intersection is S is positive, which is a weaker requirement than the requirement of the positive volume. Right? Okay. I claim that if this is true, then there is an SRP measure. So the requirement that the volume of S is positive can be weakened by requiring that the leave volume of some W intersection with S is positive. And it still has have an SRP. Okay. So that's basically the secret. Now let me give you an example of a non-uniform recovery attractor in this sense. Okay. 
which is effectively hyperbolic. So remember, we had a Smale Williams solenoid. It was given as F x y theta was given as uh, alpha x plus a cosine theta beta y plus a sine theta two theta. That was a map that you consider last time, right? As an example of a uniform hyperbolic attractor. And here alpha is less than one, beta is less than one. Uh, I would assume, for my purposes, I would assume that uh, this is the So uh, the contractions are the same in both directions. And beta is less than so zero, less than beta, less than And you remember we had a picture of the solar torus with So what I want to do is, I want to change this map. So the way I want to change this map is I want to fit, pick a fixed point. And if I don't have one, I pick a periodic or the orbit, the plenty of them, and just consider the corresponding power of them. So let me assume that I have a fixed point. Okay. Then this fixed point is hyperbolic. So this point X is fixed. It has one dimensional unstable domain. In a two dimensional stable direction. And the contraction is conformal because I assume alpha is equal to beta. So effectively, I have just one rate of contraction and one rate of expansion. The rate of expansion is 2, the rate of contraction is alpha. But A is beta. Okay, so that, that's the picture. Now, I will draw. Correspond because it's conformal in the stable direction, I will draw a one dimension picture. It's easy. For me. But then you have to use your imagination to reproduce it in the same dimension. So the picture that I have is one dimensional unstable with uh, coefficients in lambda, which is this is two, and uh, contraction, which is mu, which I call, uh, which is uh, okay. So that's that's basically. Uh, so if I look at the trajectory, then the trajectory is, I mean, it's uh, it's essentially a linear map. So the presence of cosine theta and sine theta just allows us to rotate it along the toes. But locally, it's just a linear map. Right? So effectively, what happened is that if I take a point, it's, it moves along the hyperbola. So in this, but again, this is a two-dimensional picture, and you have to extend the stable direction in two and draw the corresponding hyperbola. But that will be a complicated three-dimensional picture, so I produce its uh, uh, cut by appropriate plane, so you can see it. Okay. So this map, what you can do, you can introduce the flow, given so this direction, the coordinate in this direction is S1, the coordinate in this direction is S2. And I write the system of differential equation S1 dot is equal to log uh, lambda log 2 uh, S1, S2 dot is log beta S2. That's a local, uh, it's a vector field. It's a differential equation in a small neighborhood of fixed point. It's a vector field and it's uh, the linear vector fits, it's easy to solve. And if you solve them, you consider the corresponding local flows at the time one map. So the corresponding flow that's denoted by GT. And I consider the time one map G of the flow. And I claim this map G1 is exactly the map, the linear map which 
produced by this uh, form. So if you take the time one map, start from point X, you will jump into points which are trajectories under my map, which line up about. So S2 is two dimensional. Yes, S2 is two dimensional, so the picture is more complicated than what I have, but uh, the statement is it's a linear. And so it's kind of a map So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a function, choose a function of this type, which is one here, up to certain point R naught. So this is R naught, this R1, up to certain R1. This function is, so the co uh, the, this coordinate is U, the function is psi U, and the, the graph is psi of U is equal to U to some power of F. No, some power of F. Yeah. Whatever. So it's a power function here. Then it's one. And then you have some connection. The connection is nice. So it's a C infinity function everywhere except at the point zero. Where it behaves in this way. Okay. So what I do next is I can change this differential equation by multiplying psi of S1 squared plus S2 squared. And this is a two uh, the S2 is two dimensional. So you take the coordinate in one dimension squared plus coordinate in that direction. And the same as here. That's a local form, right? So it generates a flow, Fit, and you take the time bound map, Fimo. How does this map look like? The map looks like the form. So you start from this point. Before you would jump to this one, before making the change. Now when you make the change, what happened? is that if you are outside the disk of size R0, so this is my R0. Okay. So if you are outside size 1, it doesn't change anything. So it continues the same way as it was before. So once it gets into R0, so here the image is this one, then it jumps into this one as before. But here you have some psi, and psi is now less than 1. Once it's less than one, it means that the speed became, becomes smaller. Because what is the right hand side function of the equation? It's a speed. So now the trajectory moves with a smaller speed. It means that from, from this point on, it does not reach this, it reaches some other point. And from this point, it reach, goes this way, this way. And then it exits somewhere. And once it exits, it continues the same way as before. The size now. Now, the closer you, if you choose a hyperbola which is closer, the psi here is much smaller. So you start it somewhere here. Psi is much smaller than in the previous case. So the speed is even smaller. Which means that you would have many, many points before you pass. So you add millions of more of new points before you add. And the closer you to zero, the more you add. This procedure is called slow down. So what you have is a new map, which is time one inside this book. And then it's map F outside. Because outside nothing happened. It glues nicely together. You can verify that these two maps nicely glue together. And you get one diffeomorphism of the, uh, the, a new map of the solid torus. Right? It, it maps solid torus into itself. But now it's 
not given by this formula, but this formula outside and the map phi1 inside. It's much more a complicated map than it was before. Now, the difference between the old map, which was uniform, and this map is that this point now, this very point, that it used to be a hyper, it was a hyperbolic point, right? Now, the differential at this point is identity. Because it's so much slowed down the trajectories that at that very point it's identity, so it has zero value at this point. The map preserves not the bad measure, but the measure absolutely continues with respect to the back, which is okay. And it has zero exponent at this point. Therefore, it has zero exponent along those lines. Those lines are everywhere dense in the torus. They are not dense on the plane, but on the torus, uh, they are everywhere dense. So you have plenty of points with zero exponents. So it's not uniform in hyperbolic But one can prove that uh, the, the rest would have, there would be plenty of points with non zero exponents, but with respect to what measure? It did not have to measure. So now the picture is that you started with this solid toes, which is preserved under this map. This is my U. And if you apply the new map, uh, it was F, so let's say the new map is capital F, takes a closure, it will be inside of the solid toes. So you have an attractor. It's a new attractor, not the old one. It's not a smell Williams attractor. It's something else. It lies in the same sort of toes, but it's a different attractor. And on this attractor, you have trajectories with zero exponents. So how do you construct the measure, the invariant measure for this attractor? Well, you verify conditions E h1 and E h2, and you have to choose cones. Well, it turns out that the cones you can choose are the same cones that were before, outside. When you're outside of this area of perturbation, you choose the same cones because the map is the same. Right? And when it gets into the area of perturbation, you just take their images. So you can construct a family, and then you work a little bit around that, and you can construct a family of cones which are necessary. And then you have to compute the effective hyperbolicity for vectors in these cones. Well, it's a, it's a computation. It's a long computation. It's a difficult computation because you have to analyze the behavior of this nonlinear system of differential equation and it's not immediately treated. It doesn't have uh, you know, explicit solutions or anything like that. So you have to kind of work with a system of differential equations to get proper estimates. But once you get them, you can verify conditions E h1 and E h2, and you get uh, effective hyperbolicity, from which you then get, uh, say that not because of, of that, on, on, and if you, you have it on a set of positive volume, then you say, well, now I we'll have an SRT. And there's no other way, at least I don't know of any other way, to construct SRT for this particular example, but just verify this E h1 and E h2. It's just two conditions. Not that much to, not, not that many conditions to deal with, but uh, you know, they are not trivial. So I think it kind of answers your question. Yes, it does. Okay. So, I have 15 minutes in which I would like to prove the theory, which <laughs> is almost impossible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think the set of an hour is more questions than fact. So, we did say that suspension flows in your uh, construction and we understand many measures in case of suspension flows but, in this, but I'm not sure the other way around I mean I have the flow and I started the time on map or the contrary map of it and I'm not sure how, how I can construct the cones uh, so that they are compatible with the previous structure or whatever I want to say well it's not it's not at all obvious and it's a it's a it's a part of this uh, study of this example is to say it's a, I mean, but when you are outside, you just take a vector, it takes an unstable form as it goes, and it will shrink as it's supposed to shrink. So 
that's kind of limits. Then you get into the perturbation. What you want to do, you want to somehow move those holes through the brain, how, the, the way they move. And then, so what you do, you just say, okay, here is my point. Here, here is my point. And I have an unstable point. Right? And then I apply, then I move here. And I get another point, which is the image of that point. And then I expand it. Then I take this image, move on, get another code in the next one, and expand it. And that's how I construct a family of codes when they go through. Well, I have to prove that I can do that. That's not obvious. But that's true. That can be done. And this way you obtain this family of codes. But then when you exit, you have to show that what you get gets inside of the cones that existed there before coming from the linear part. And that's another part of the proof. To show that it, when, when you do these procedures that I just described, in the end, when you exit after who knows millions of iterations, you get inside of the standard unstable cone that was before. That can be proved. That's true. But it requires some work. Let's give you a restriction on your equation, on your differential equation, or not? No. Just what I said. Restrictions is that that is a power function. That's what is used. If it's not a power function, I mean, it's just a function of this type, I don't know. But I heavily use the fact that I know my functions essentially completely. So I can carry out particular calculations for this differential. That's. This is just a particular application. This is just a particular example, which cannot be handled by any other known methods to construct an SMH. Okay. Yes. Or at least I don't know any other methods that would allow to construct an SMH. OK. Well, now I have <laughs> less time. I say a few words. I mean, I'm not going to bother with the proof because it's too complicated. But I would like to give you some ideas of how to handle this. And the idea is that you take, so once you have a comb, you can introduce. can introduce the notion of an admissible mind. Admissible. Admissible mind. That's one of the central notions in the whole business. Now what is that? It's a local manifold person, so this is an unstable home K U S. So you want to construct a smooth mind which is almost like an unstable mind. So you represent it as an image under exponential map, some graph of some function psi u. So you call this v u. It's written as an exponential of some uh, w psi s w. And w belongs to some ball in the unstable, I mean, the code has a central subs, uh, you know, the central line or the central subspace. So it's a cone, it's a ball centered at zero of some radius r in this unstable subspace. And it maps it into something. Now, what something? I don't have a stable one. What I'm saying is that it, what, what I want, I want psi s to map e u s into some subspace f, and f is transversal to e u. 
So I choose a transversal direction, which may not be the direction of the stable problem. Okay. Just mm -hmm. so say 90 degree direction. The, the angle is say 90 degree. So that's my function. So that's what I call a, 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 an admissible it's pretty much like a local unstable mind, except that it's not invariant. And I don't know if it's contract or not. I mean, it's just a manifold which looks like an, uh, a local unstable mind. But it may not have such nice properties. Then I do what I did before, namely, Namely, I consider standard pairs B in rho. So each of them has a density. So I have plenty of those uh, at each point x on my in my space S, in my set S of positive volume, I draw those unstable uh, as those are admissible manifolds. You can say an uh, unstable admissible because they go inside of the unstable columns, right? And you add the density, and you get the standard pairs, the collection of standard pairs. So you have, so you need some parameters. Remember how we did it with the uniform pattern. In the case, we had some parameters, which is uh, gamma, control the norm of the psi S. Then kappa control the third of norm of psi s r the size of psi s. Right? So it's the same story as it's a uniform factor. But now I need one more parameter theta, which controls the angle. Angle between F and B. You add an extra parameter because you don't have nice splitting. So you have to control how this goes. So you get collection R. And you get a collection Ri of Vu, which satisfies all have all this, uh, satisfies these restrictions. So this is less than gamma, this is less than alpha, R is R, theta is theta. So the angle is bigger than theta. So you control this, it's a geometry of the unstable, uh, of the admissible mind. You control geometry of the admissible mind. That's the set of parameters. Now a new element comes in which didn't exist before, which is another set of parameters, J, which two parameters, lambda and C, two parameters, lambda and C, and a number M at And what I introduce, I introduce a space R, J, J, union, So I do not include n as a part of j for some reasons. So I have two parameters which gives me j, and I have n as another additional part. All together I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parameters. Too many to control, but, but what can I do? And this is the set of those, uh, so you take an admissible manifold V, or how it's you know, denoted, W, or V, V, so V. Take its image Fn, this is number N, under my okay. So this is my point X, this is my point F and X, right? This is my view. 
And this is FND. Who knows what it is, right? I, I draw a nice picture, but it may not be nice. It's something. Okay, I don't know much. And what I require is a formula. So the requirement is that the distance between f minus uh, k x f minus k one is less or equal than c lambda bar. That's these two numbers. The distance between x and y for every x and y in f and x. So if I take any two points, this is my x and this is my y, they uniformly contract when they reach uh, during the time n when they reach x. So it's a uniform shrinking when you go back. That's what unstable manifold is supposed to do, right? When you have global unstable manifold, when you go backward, everything shrinks uniform. So I require the, so my space consists of those uh, admissible manifolds whose n image have uniform contraction under my map. That's my space. That's that's collection. And finally, I define R i intersect with R j union. That's my space R of admissible manifolds. That's my space. That's what I want to do. Okay? And then I add densities, I mean, these are admissible manifolds of a certain type. So what, what happened is that this controls geometry of admissible. This controls dynamics of admissible manifolds at a certain time. Yeah. It doesn't control it for all times. It controls it for some time n. So this is a collection of admissible manifolds whose geometry and dynamics are controlled in this way. And then they consider the space R prime, which is R, which are mu from R and the density rho. And the density rho is uh, as before. So it's controlled, the norm is controlled by L, the Hölder norm is controlled by L, and yeah, and that's it. That, I mean, that's exactly as it was in the previous. So there's one more parameter, which is now L, which controls the density. Eight parameters all together. Okay. So what I now have, I have a space of admissible uh, standard pairs, which consists of some funny chosen and admissible manifolds and density. And I prove that these spaces are compact in the nature of topology. Topology introduced as before. No difference. There's a compact topological spaces. Uh, and I and that's it. So then, then I do what I did before, namely, I consider the space of measures M on R prime. So you have all these admissible manifolds sitting in the neighborhood of the attractor, densities on them, and then you have measures on this topological, compact topological space. And for each measure eta in this space, you produce a measure mu, such that mu e is given as you know double integral. This is correct, uh, correct. It's uh, so it's a measure of the surface on the uh, anyway. Let's try to figure this out. So you take chi e, you take d, and you take rho, d m, d u, d. So that's. And 
That's the point. So it's a double integration. First, you integrate over the density and leave volumes, then you integrate over eta, which is a corresponding space. Okay. So what you have, eta is moved into mu by some perturbator f phi. And this is a continuous Easy to follow. This is a new volume. Okay. And this is interaction. Yeah, okay. Then we are very close to the end, so if I take maybe a few minutes extra, then I'm sorry. Uh, then you do as we did before, namely you consider uh, the space M which is phi of M prime, the densities uh, whose me measures of whose norm is less or equal to Remember it as we did. And you get the space. And what I claim is that any measure that lies in M is a me finite measure which is an SRP. Because that's how this is. Because they have on admissible manifold, it has uh, the density. This is so that's an SMP. And any measure that sits on this space is an SMP. So, as before, when we, 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 we consider hyperbolic attractors, we also prove that this space is invariant under the density. And then, what you do, you start with an admissible manifold. W, uh, VU, you take a measure MV, you consider this geometric approach, sequence of measures near M, which is 1 over N sum F star K MV U uh, K from 0 to M minus 1, except that this is not a local unstable manifold, but an admissible manifold, unstable admissible. So you want to show that the subsequence M J, if you choose M J here, then it converges to some measure mu, which is an SRP measure. That's what I want to prove. Right? That's the essence of the geometric approach that we discussed. I use the same geometric approach in this case. And all I need to show is that if I take the measure MF, MVU, and apply my map, and before in the, in the uniform hyperbolic case, what happened is that you apply this uh, uh, F star, and the space M is invariant, which means that the whole se sequence lies in this space. Once you start from a measure in this space, you apply the sequence F star, it lies in the same space. And once it lies in the same space, the, uh, I mean, it's a compact space, the limit lies in this space, so the limit is an invariant uh, SRP. So that's what the uniform hyperbolic is. In my case, I start with a measure line in this space, which is good. So I apply my map. If, it may, if the image lies in this space, I'm done. Unfortunately, it does not. That's a problem. Now, why it does not? I will explain just that, and I start. It does not for the following reason. And then I tell, I mean, I explain you why, why it, it, is, it is a problem, and I say a couple of words how to overcome it. The problem is that you started with an admissible manifold, which is W. You have a set S here of positive leaf ball. Remember that was our assumption. There's a set of effectively hyperbolic projectors sitting on W. It has positive leaf ball. And then you move it forward. This is F and W. I take this point, which is effectively hyperbolic point, I take its image. So I, I have this one, then I have F, W, then I have F squared, W, etc. I come to something. Okay? And this will be my actually 
capital letter. Remember that I had a letter capital M, where I kind of had this. So that's that's a picture I have when I take the, the unstable uh, uh, admissible manifold, move it, and I get just images. There's nothing else but just images of these guys under my map. Now I have this good point, effectively hyperbolic point. And I move, so I consider these numbers, the images of this point, so it was a projected And I have another point, say one. And I have the images of this point. Now, here are the two problems. Now, problem number one. I can only hope to control anything when I deal with points which are effectively hyperbolic. If the point is not, I mean, the set has positive pressure, but the, it's not the whole, it, it, it's not an open set, it's, it's nothing. It's just a set of, it's a counter set of positive pressure. There are plenty of points which are not affected by hyperbolic. Which means that if I take a point which is not affected by hyperbolic, right, some point Z here, and I take its trajectory, I cannot control anything around this point. I just don't know anything about this So that's the first problem. I'm just telling you where the problem is. And then I tell you how to handle that. <laughs> but it's clear that since I take the trajectory which is not effectively hyperbolic, I have no knowledge about it. So I cannot control small uh, you know, piece of unstable admissible manifold around this point. Because I have no knowledge of what's happening. When, when, when this point moves. The second problem is that if I take a good point, which is effectively hyperbolic, then what I know about is the following. I take, so now it's a good point. I have a piece of admissible mind, a very small piece of mind, and I start moving. And I wonder what happened with this little piece of admissible manifold when I move forward. And my, the whole idea of effective hyperbolicity is that you can control what happened to that. Remember, we talked about this effect of domination and how it changes the curvature, etc., etc. But since asymptotically this defect essentially disappears, what it says that you have a subsequence of times. So this is this is time from zero to n. And there is a subsequence of times of positive density, positive frequency, such that if I get to those times, they are called effectively hyperbolic times, then I guarantee that at those times, so this is a bad time, this is a bad time, this is effectively hyperbolic time. I guarantee I have a good piece, this guy may, may contract here, I mean, it does whatever it wants. But once it comes to a good moment, it becomes long, good, unstable, admissible manifold, such that if I move backward, it will give me That's one can prove using conditions of effective hyperbolicity. Which means that if I consider this piece of all these good points and they, have, and they form positive measure, what happened is I take this point, I mark those moments where I have a good admissible mind, another moment where it was a good admissible mind, here it has a good admissible mind. In between, I don't know what happened to the image of the admissible mind. Then I get another point, y, and it may have good piece here, it may not have good piece here at this time. The times are different for different points. Then it may have good piece here, and then not have a good piece here. Okay. So for each trajectory, I just mark those times where I have good pieces of unstable and where I can control that. So this picture is kind of uh, chaotic. You have here and here and here and here you have those good pieces of admissible manifold which correspond to the points, uh, effectively hyperbolic points. Okay? 
All I'm saying is that the dense, because density of the piece are positive. And this has positive leaf movements. You, you, you obtain a big collection of good pieces of admissible matter, <laughs> such that if you compare the percentage of those which are good to the total number of uh, what, the admissible manifolds that you can construct, it's uniformly peak, independent of n. That means that the measure mu n that we constructed, which is again this k from 0 to n minus 1 f star k n u, the m w, this measure mu n can be decomposed as mu n plus whatever kappa n. And mu n is a good part which is carried by those good pieces of uh, admissible manifolds, so all the good admissible uh, effective types. So it's a projection of measure. So mu n is a projection. The, the, the measure mu n does not lie in this space. But it has a projection on this space, which is uniformly big. So now you look at this projection, and you find the subsequence which converges to a measure which is an SRB measure, which is a good part, absolutely continuous part, of the, of the limit measure mu. So you get a piece of a measure. Mu has a good projection on the same space. The limit measure. And then, if you choose an ergodic part of, uh, of the measure mu, then when you decompose measure and you take ergodic part, it's only one of them can appear. The second will disappear because of periodicity. So you find a ergodic component of the measure mu, which essentially consists of the projection, and it's an SRB measure. That's very I'm waving my hands, you know, let's say, appealing to your kind of imagination, etc., etc. You call it outline of outline of outline of the proof, etc., <laughs> etc. Et but it, I hope it gives you at least some vague ideas what's going on. It's a much more elaborated proof of what you saw in the rest of reasonably good details in the universe. complete the proof Yes, so proof of the, um, so let me remind you of the lemma that we will prove it. <laughs> so let, so uh, then I will, I will kind of remind us of the general setting of the not end of notation on this side. So let K L in I, X, gamma S, K L, some i between 0 
and K with M I of X. <coughs> so then there exists some IJ. So this, of course, is a crucial uh, is a crucial lemma for the whole construction, and this is where we will use in a fundamental way the fact that the rectangle is nice, which we have not used yet. So let me just remind you of of the setting that we've got. So we've got a rectangle. We've got our set of so this is a rectangle. This is P. We've got the stable manifold here, and the stable manifold here, and the stable manifold here. So the nice, niceness property, so we have this. Uh, this region here is called gamma hat. So we have a rectangle gamma. It's contained in gamma hat. Gamma hat is this whole region. Yeah. Um, and the niceness property says that so gamma is nice. This means that um, forward images of the stable manifolds of both P and Q, I just had it once, do not intersect the interior of gamma hat, which is empty, and the backward images of the unstable manifolds do not intersect the interior. Empty. Yes. Yes. Just, just these, just these pieces here. Just these pieces here. Uh, so this is obviously true. For example, if P and Q are fixed points, right? So if the the easiest situation to have in mind is whether they're fixed points. If they're fixed points, then the um, every point on the obviously this is embedded. If they're fixed point, this this just the image of this is just a smaller version of itself, and so on. And the same for these in backward time. If they're periodic points, then a a, a first uh, in, in, uh, first consequence of this is that the periodic point P never comes back to the interior. Okay, but that's not enough. Uh, this periodic point in principle might come back very close, might come back outside, and you might have some iterate of this periodic point which is here, and it's and the image of this, if it comes very close, this is of course shrinking exponentially fast. Right? So the after some images of this periodic point, this will be very small, but if the periodic point has very large period and if it comes back very close to here, then you might have that the image at some point of the local stable manifold might intersect the interior. This is what we want to avoid. Okay? It's uh, intuitively it's just saying that this periodic point stays stays away from this region until it comes back at the end of the period. Okay, so kind of condition like that. Uh, 
Um, this is a generalization of the notion of a nice interval in one dimensional dynamics. This is used very much. An interval whose boundaries never come back to themselves. Okay, and what is the what is the um, what is the setting here? So, so let me write first of all. Uh, okay, so the, if you remember the notation, um, let me write here. The notation is that we have our collection of hyperbolic branches, so uh, gamma. <coughs> is nice and almost recurrent, uh, hyperbolically almost recurrent. <coughs> so we have a, this means that every time you have an almost return, you have a hyperbolic branch. So we now have a collection of hyperbolic branches, C hat S I J. I Q, I J. So this is just an indexing of all the hyperbolic branches. We return time i. There's a finite number of them which we index by j. And then, if you remember, we defined um, C S I J to be equal to um, F minus i of C hat U. I J the section C S right so this is all the leaves that you get by pulling back so we have I'm going to so we have, so we have here one stable split C hat S I J and we have one unstable step here, which is its image. So this is F i, this is C hat U i j. And then we have, we look at all the stable steps and we pull them back. And I pointed out that this in general is contained in, but not equal to, the union of leaves inside C. So this is not the same as C hat S I J intersection C S. Right? So in here, here you have a family of stable leaves. Inside this set, you have also a family of stable leaves. You could say, okay, now just take all the stable leaves that contain in here, but if you map them, if you look at the image of all the stable leaves here, they might map perhaps subjectively onto the family of stable leaves here, but there might be extra ones. There might be some of those that at the time might fall in some gaps. Okay? And those ones we want to exclude from our definition of C S I J. Because those are ones that have a later return time in the future. So this is really the set that is going to give us our partition element and then we just define gamma S I J is just C S I J intersection C U. So this is a family of stable leaves, and this is the corresponding Cantor set that lies on these stable leaves. So that we just take the intersection with all the unstable leaves. And these are the sets that we're talking about here because these are the sets that are going to be elements of the young of, of the, uh, these are the sets that form the Cantor set gamma is a union of the gamma S I J. We've shown that already. Okay, so the we've got all this collection corresponding to all these branches, but it, many of these they will overlap, they will intersect, and so on. And the key point here is to say that there's this nested of this jointness property. And as we saw yesterday, once you have this nested of this jointness property, then you can take the maximal uh, elements and you can form a nice partition of disjoint elements so we everything works well and we get the young path. Okay? So the problem is to get this nested and or disjointness property which is the key point. So the first uh, observation so I'm going to to, to, to start by building a kind of sub -lemma.
is that if two So for any hyperbolic branch, for any hyperbolic branch, Fi, C hat S I J, C hat I J, we have that the Interior, we have that the interior of the image F K of C hat S I J does not intersect the boundary of gamma hat. So what I'm looking at is the images of this stable state before it returns, right? So this stable state returns at time i, and during its itinerary up to time i, all kinds of things can happen. In general, it will be outside, but it can also come back to this rectangle, okay? Nothing is stopping it from coming back. It will, in general, possibly, if it comes back, it might be in a gap of the Cantor set, or at the moment, we don't even have a Cantor set in principle, okay? We just have a stable strip that after time i comes back with hyperbolic estimates to this, so at the moment all we know that. And what this is saying is that we cannot, at no point, can we have this picture here. Fk of c hat s i j. Or this picture here. This is what the lemma says. And can you see why that is true? You're not allowed to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> can anyone see why this, this, uh, so this is for some k, okay, let's say for all k, equals 1 to i minus 1. So, well, including 0 and 1 is kind of trivial, but that's true. But along the intermediate orbits, this cannot be true. Oh, it's from, niceness. from niceness. Why does the niceness imply this? Because, that's right, because if you look at this piece here, this is a piece of the local stable manifold of P, right? And it lies in the interior of this of this uh, of this region, okay? And we know that this region k is sometime between f and i, so we know that the image of this goes here, and then this at some point goes to here, goes to this step here. And since this is the interior, it would imply that this piece would lie somewhere in the interior here. We'll come to that, which is exactly not allowed by the niceness. In fact, this is exactly it. The whole niceness assumption is just for this. And essentially, the reason our result is in dimension 2 is also because of the niceness, because we need this assumption. And we don't seem to be able to, to complete everything with that. Okay, and why is this very important? So an immediate corollary of this is that if you have two stable strips, so let me, this is a <coughs> oh, kind of part of this sublemma, kind of an immediate color of this part, is in particular, um, any two, any two, Stable strips C hat S I J and 
and um, C hat S I prime J prime are nested or disjoint. Why is that so? Uh, so this is with, yes, so why is that so? Let's suppose that we have another stable strip here. And let's suppose that it looks like this. So these two stable strips overlap. This is C hat S I prime J prime. Why is this picture not possible? Because then, so, if i is equal to i prime, this is clearly not possible simply because they cannot have the same, uh, at the same time, they cannot both come back, they cannot overlap like that and both come back to unstable strips. Right? So clearly, i cannot be the same as i prime. If i is different from i prime, then look at the one that's bigger. Suppose i prime is bigger than i, okay? Then look at the image at time i, which is when the first one comes back. Okay, so the first one comes back like this what is the second one going to be? So, just because of the geometry of this, so it will share this step here, so that means that the second one is going to be something like this. Right, because they have to share this piece here. In particular, in the interior of the second one is the boundary of the first one, which lands exactly onto this. So that means that the second one will fall on here, will contain a piece of the boundary, contradicting the first step. So uh, once you have this niceness property, it's very um, simple to see that we have this nested of these joints. So the, ne the nested can have, so this is where you have overlap. Of course, the, the uh, so they can be nested. So you could have that this one is actually bigger. Let me just uh, remark on this. You, you may have, so this other picture is possible, that one, uh, okay, let me just show that one is contained in the other, obviously. Okay, I mean, nestedness is obviously, so if one is bigger or smaller than the other, they can be contained, there's no contradiction there. All it says is that this one maps maps inside, yeah, okay? And this may be uh, just a kind of a higher order refinement of the partition, or it could be the simplest way to imagine is that this is what I was saying before, is that this thing falls in a gap of the Cantor set, and this thing will actually contain points that return at a later time, okay? So you can have this nest in this problem. So this is not enough, though, because what we want is for this gamma s k as this is uh, these are just the disjointness of the strip. So what we've what we've shown so far is that these strips are nested or disjoint. But the fact yes right. So the fact that they can be nested means that it does not automatically imply this right. So we can have two strips here. Sorry, I started explaining this and I forgot what I was trying to explain. So we, we may have two strips here. So we can have C hat S I prime J prime contained in C hat S I J. Okay? And then it's not completely obvious. And then, uh, in, in principle, the corresponding sets CSIJ, which is the set of stable leaves, may intersect, right? Because now we are taking, as, we, as I emphasized several times before, so uh, how are we defining these two sets? Well, we're taking um, at, uh, at this time I, we're taking all the stable leaves. We're taking all the stable leaves and we're pulling them back. Okay? And then this has some other return time. So this one has return time i. 
and then this one here that is inside has some other return time and comes back to some other unstable state here. And this here has return time i prime, f i prime. Okay? And at, if i prime is bigger than i, then at time i it will look like this. So this will be f mm -hmm. i of c hat s i prime j prime. And now you pull back the list, so you define this C S I J in both cases. So here you take all the leaves, all the leaves that um, the intersection of all the stable leaves, and you pull them back. Okay, and this gives you your C S I prime J prime. And for this one, for I J, you also pull back the leaves from him. So basically, uh, what we want is these two sets to be disjoint, right? That's what's going to give us the estimate, which essentially means showing that, which essentially is equivalent to the fact that this falls in a gap here, so that there's no, so that all the leaves that you pull back here are disjoint from the leaves that you pull back from this. Okay, essentially. So how do we argue this? Um. Okay, so this is a little bit of a delicate <coughs> argument. assuming in the setting of this lemma, so I have a point x. Okay, I don't know why I use different indexing for this sub lemma and that lemma, so I should have used more consistent indexing. But anyway, I have some point here x. This belongs to um, gamma KLS, which in particular means that it applies to this strip that it uh, is contained in this step here, which is C hat S K L. And then we have a point uh, F I of X. F I of X, which also belongs to gamma. So we have X is in gamma, F I of X is in gamma. So this means because fi of x is in gamma, it uh, also belongs to uh, stable and unstable strips. So all these, so all, all, these uh, all, all these things that I wrote, the equivalent statement also holds for Cu, right? So it's reversible in both cases. So here we have that fi of x Sorry, sorry, sorry. So, this is FK of X. So, this is C, folks. This is C hat U KL. Okay. So, this is just the, the hyperbolic branch that defines gamma SKL. And our lemma says, suppose that there's some intermediate point here where you fall into gamma. 
So f i of x. Suppose that this point here falls into gamma. Um, okay. So. So we know that so since x is in gamma and fi of x is in gamma, so since by assumption x is in gamma and fi of x is in gamma, so there exists a hyperbolic branch. Because by assumption a rectangle is hyperbolically recurrent, so there exists a hyperbolic branch with return time i. So there exists a hyperbolic branch uh, f i c hat s i j to c hat e i j. So there is some hyperbolic branch here that contains x, and it's unstable branch contains f i of x. So this is c hat u i j. And there is one that I'm not drawing here, I'm not going to draw, which is c hat s i j. And also, so here we have x to f i of x is a return from gamma to gamma, therefore there's a hyperbolic branch. And here we have f m, so if you write m is equal to k minus i, okay? Then f i of x also belongs to gamma, f k of x also belongs to gamma. So from here to here, this is also return from gamma to gamma. And therefore, there's also a hyperbolic branch associated to this return. Okay, and I'm going to draw that hyperbolic branch like this. I'm going to draw just the stable step of this hyperbolic branch. So this here is C hat S M N. Same. Okay. So I'm not drawing. Past, so I'm draw, I've got one full hyperbolic branch that I've drawn, which is this one at time k, which is the one I have by assumption. And then I'm, I'm assuming that we have an intermediate return. Okay? And this intermediate return, it's a return to gamma. Therefore, there are two more hyperbolic branches associated to this return, which is one from here, which I've not drawn the stable one. I've just drawn the unstable one. And one that goes from here to here, which I've just drawn the stable one. That's because I don't know what's the relation between the stable one at i and the stable one at k. And this is exactly what I'm going to want to say something about, right? Um, about what they look like. So, um, what I can say is that uh, since x belongs to both, so since x belongs to both C at S. Um, so X belongs to C hat S KL intersection C hat S uh, IJ. Okay. And so this means that these two stable steps intersect. And what did we just say about the fact that these two stable steps intersect is that they must be nested or disjoint, right? So, but C hat S K L C hat S I J must be nested or disjoint. And since they're not disjoint, they must be nested. And uh, so which one is going to include the other one? 
So claim it has to be the one with the lower return time has to include the other one. So we must have, so we have that C hat S i j must contain C hat S k f, right? So the picture must be that C s i j is kind of either is equal to, which is actually what we're going to show, or it should be, it should contain like this. And in the same way, we get that here also, there is, um, there is the unstable one for this state that I did not draw before. And this also must essentially contain it like this. Okay, so they must be nested in this way. So it's a lot of lines here. Okay, so the 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 finalized finalize the argument here. We say this. Okay, we want to look at what happens here at this time i. Okay, so we know that this. So this here is c hat s i j, okay? So this, all, all this step here, maps to this step here, okay? And therefore, um, the step c hat k s, which is inside, must map to something that has full length. So the boundaries of this, it's just a geometric argument. The boundaries of this lie on the boundaries of this. So this step here must have full height in here. So it must be somewhere, um, so it must contain x. So it must somehow go from top to bottom here. Right? And by exactly the same argument looking here, so if you look at the three image of this unstable strip inside here, again, the, uh, the vertical boundaries uh, lie on these vertical boundaries, which come from here on this strip. So it means that the pre-image of this must be full length here in this direction. Okay? But these two sets are just images of the same set, right? because this white stable strip is the image is the pre-image of this white stable strip? So this was a hyperbolic branch. So the two sets that meet here are the same thing. The pre-image of this under time i minus k is the same thing as the image of this under time i. So they must uh, be the set must have full length and full length and full height, and therefore it has to be exactly the whole uh, this whole intersection. Okay. So the conclusion is that. So similarly, so we repeat a similar argument. So similarly, we have that CS. Um, so CU, C hat, U, uh, M, and N must contain C hat U. L. Okay, and so by this argument that I just described, we actually conclude. So hopefully you see why why we're doing this. So the conclusion. Okay, so the conclusion of this is that. Fi, this is what we're really going to use. Fi of C hat S K L is equal to this intersection C hat U I J intersection C hat S N N, okay, which is also F of minus N. C hat 
So I'm not really moved to justify why we want this, but this geometric argument shows exactly that you have this, where ij and mn are the two hyperbolic branches that you get by taking into account that this intermediate return belongs to gamma. And so you get one hyperbolic branch at time i, and you get another hyperbolic branch at time n to, to include that. Okay? And this geometric argument shows that these images are exactly equal to this intersection of this particular stable strip and that particular unstable strip. So it's not very intuitive. The uh, geometric argument is not that difficult, but it's not very intuitive why we're doing all this. And then the conclusion now is just one, a one line, a one long line calculation, which is the following. Okay, so the conclusion from this is that now we start with S. So this is just now uh, applying all the definitions. So CSKL is equal. So it's enough to prove, um, okay, so uh, CSKL is the set of stable leaves right, associated to the, to KL, and this is by definition F minus K of C hat U KL intersection CS, okay, and I'm going to write this, I'm going to split it up with K minus K, I'm going to split it up in this I and M, so I'm going to write this as F minus I, composed with F minus m of this, okay, and now I'm going to split it up, this f minus m, I'm going to split up the two pieces, so k l of the section f minus m of c s. And now I'm going to do some really dumb kind of rearranging and going back and forth to get what I want, but I couldn't find a simpler way, so now I'm going to like F minus I of um, so uh, yes, yeah, so now I'm going to use this F minus M of C hat U K L is equal to this intersection, right? This was exactly why I needed to do that whole argument there. And so now I'm going to write this as um, C hat U IJ intersection C hat S and N intersection F minus N C S. And now I'm going to uh, use the definition of this. Okay, so this is equal to F minus I, C hat U, I J, intersection. So oh. this is, uh, by definition, this is F minus M of C hat U, and N intersection, C S. Uh, intersection f minus n cx and then this is equal to um, so now this is just f minus m so this f minus m of cs appears twice right? so this is f minus m of c hat u m n intersection f minus m of cs intersection f minus m of cs so I can basically disregard one, so I get F minus I of C hat U I J intersection F minus N of C hat U and N intersection C S. Yes, so all this all this stuff is just to kind of uh, immerse one in the other. Maybe there's an easier way to do it. But once I've got this, then I go back, I just go back to the definition. So this is F minus I of C hat U, I J 
intersection, this is again CS and N. And now I use, uh, okay, so now this is contained in So CSMN is just a collection of stable leaves, so this is just contained in F minus I of C hat U I J section CX, which is the set of all stable leaves, and this is exactly equal by definition to C S I J. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did <didn't> that <have> computer. <laughs> it's, uh... So, to be honest, well, especially this morning, I, uh, but also in general, it's not somehow, it looks like it's an argument that should just be geometrically obvious, but it's not. You know, in the end, this nastiness comes out from the calculation. I can't really say that it's uh, geometrically obvious that it should be like that. Um, but it requires, this is just, this is just completely formal, but it requires this, this argument here, which, which shows the geometry, assuming you have some intermediate return, what is the geometry of this? So this is it, this proves the lemma because of course CSKL is contained in CSIJ and, and uh, gamma SKL is just intersection of this with the unstable leaves and, and gamma SIJ is just intersection of that with the unstable leaves so this implies that gamma SKL is, in, is contained in CSIJ. So this is assuming that there's a, there is a return then we show that there exists actually a CSIJ which contains CSKL associated to the return of time i. That was the point, right? Is that if k is not actually the first return, if there's a return before time k, then your point actually belongs to one of the stable, to one of the S subsets that we've defined associated to time i. Okay. So that's it. So this completes the proof of this of this uh, this jointness or nastiness which is what we needed to construct the answer. Okay, so now uh, after having wiped you out with this last argument, I will say something about the the proof of the second of the theorem number two that I stated at the beginning which is the existence of a saturated rectangle, the construction of a saturated rectangle. I hope I'll just give you an idea without doing a too technical calculation, but I think that is also a very important uh, part of the overall argument. So let me remind you, if I remember exactly what the theorem said, the theorem said that if we have, so let gamma zero, be a nice uh, hyperbolically almost recurrent okay be nice hyperbolically almost recurrent okay so then then there exists gamma which contains gamma zero, which is nice um, hyperbolically recurrent, and saturated. This is the key point. Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. Um, uh, 
let's see, have I not shown that? We showed it as part of the, so we, once we had this lemma on the nested of disjointness, right? Then we said that all this, the family gamma S, IJ is uh, partially ordered by inclusion. And then we took a maximal element, right? And that gives a cover of gamma with these, by disjoint sets. And then we showed at the end, I think I discussed that, that you must have a um, first return time, right? Remember, because if, um, so if x belongs to gamma s i j, when this is a maximal element, then i must be the first return time of that point. Because if not, we contradict this lemma. There was a little argument that I gave at the end of the lecture yesterday. I think this was your question. To, to make sure that there's a first return time, yes. So yesterday, if you look at the notes, there's a, we, we covered that already. So once you have this lemma, is crucial. But you can see that this lemma basically says, I mean, this, this, uh, this is the argument, basically, because it says that if it was, OK, this is the wrong picture. If it was not the first return time, then you would have, it would be contained in some bigger set, which would contradict the fact that the set you've chosen is maximal in this, in this partial order already. Right? So that's what guarantees that you have first return time. So for the construction, for the construction we used uh, the fact that, the, that you have these hyperbolic branches and that it's saturated, okay? At some point in the proof we used crucially the fact that it's saturated. So saturated is a very strong property. As I said, it means you've got all the leaves that you need. Every time you pull back, you've got the set of leaves. And in general, you just given a rectangle, there's no reason why it should be saturated. So this is a crucial, this is a crucial um, part of the argument. So how does this work? So the nice thing is that it's a little bit, we, we want to construct gamma, okay? So we will construct it basically the way you usually construct the uh, horseshoes. So the first, what we have to begin with is a hyperbolically almost a color, okay? So again, once again, we have our families. By now you're used to, we have all our family of hyperbolic branches. Um, so we have our left angle. Yeah. And now this is very similar to the usual horseshoe setup. It's a generalization. What is the usual horseshoe when you have a generally a hyperbolic set? What you have usually is you have a family of hyperbolic branches, right? In the horseshoe, in the classical horseshoe, you just have two hyperbolic branches. So you have one, two, okay? And you know that this one maps to an unstable step here, and this one maps to an unstable step here. Okay, this is the classical horseshoe uh, picture. Uh, so what is the difference between our setup and the classical horseshoe setup? First of all, we have an infinite number of, hy of hyperbolic branches. And secondly, they don't all come back at the same time. This is the most difficult part. So the crucial part of the horseshoe here is that they both come back at the same time, after one iterate, after k iterates, whatever. So we just have one iterate of the map where these two steps come back. Okay? And then how do we construct the kind of the cantor set, the, the, the invariant set, the maximal invariant set? Okay, there's various constructions. But basically, one of the constructions you can do is you just say, take the set of points that stay inside these two strips for all time, forward and backward time. Right? This is the kind of standard. So the maximal invariant set is the set of points that stay inside here for all time. And you can show that this has a structure, has a kind of, it's basically a rectangle in our sense, because you can show that all the set of points that stay here in forward time, you, they will be contained inside these these unions of these strips, and you make these refinements, and these strips, they all kind of converge to a cantor set of stable leaves, and then you look at backward time, and you see that you converge to a cantor set of unstable leaves, and then you get your cantor set as the maximum mm -hmm. invariant set. Okay? So what we would like is to try to do something similar with our countable collection. 
So we'd like to define a kind of maximal invariant set. So define a maximal maximal set for these branches. So how do we do that? The problem, so we'd like to make sure we take, in other words, we want points that always stay inside the stable branches, say, if you're looking forward. Okay? Now, in general, because these are countable and they can be maybe nested, okay, we know they're nested or disjoints. But if you take a point here, so let me draw a better, let me leave all this picture. So we have this countable collection of stable steps. Now if you take a point here, in general, it would belong to many of these stable steps. So to an infinite number of these stable steps. So it would be part of one stable step here. Inside this, there will be many stable steps. One of them will contain x, OK? Inside this one, there will be also many stable steps. This one contains x, and so on. And now we want to make sure that x, we iterate x by one of these stable steps. And we want to make sure that its image, f i of x, also belongs to a stable slip. Right? I mean, the union of all stable slips does not cover the whole rectangle. There will be gaps in these stable slips. And how do we know that f i of x belongs to stable slip? We don't know for sure. So how do we know whether to choose x, you know, whether x is good, at least for the first iterate? Because it may depend on which iterate we choose. So we can choose an infinite number of, st of branches under which to iterate x, OK? And all we need to, to choose is a good one. So we can choose. If we iterate for the first branch, and we see that under the first biggest branch, the maximal branch here, uh, f i of x falls in a gap, we say, ah, OK, that didn't work. Let me try to go to the next one. Okay? And let's see when I iterate by the next one, if it still falls in a gap, I'm done. But if it falls in a stable slip like this, then it's okay. Then I can choose that iterate. And then I need to do the same thing. So here, I, um, here it also, this, the image now may belong not just to one stable slip, but to an infinite number of stable slips. And I need to choose which one to iterate. And I say, okay, let me try with the biggest one. And if it falls in a gap, that's no good. Let me try with the next one, and I keep trying. And I see if there is one choice that allows me at the next iterate to fall inside another stable state. And I keep going on like that. So basically, I take all the points for which there exists such a choice of, of, uh, of iterates, such that it always belongs to a stable state. Let me try to formalize that a little bit better. Basically, I define a kind of symbolic dynamics. So um, I can define it like this. So let me define so a sequence H of Z is equal to a sequence I M I index set here, this is ij inside this index set, is called, is a hyperbolic sequence, well let me put h plus because I'm going to look for the moment in forward time, is a hyperbolic sequence if
have So for simplicity, I'm just going to look at the forward. You can have similar definitions for the backwards, but it's a bit technical. I think this gives the, this gives the idea. So in forward time, what I'm saying is uh, that I look at an infinite sequence here, and I call this a hyperbolic sequence if it has that property that you start with some i0, j0, which is the stable slip to which x belongs, right? And then when I iterate by I1, okay, I iterate, uh, let's see, how is the, is the index incorrect here? Um, I iterate by I1, and then I fall in C hat S I1, J1, so I fall inside some stable slip given by the sequence, and then I iterate again by I2, okay, and then I fall inside this sequence C, so I iterate by I1 plus I2, and then I iterate in some sequence uh, I2, J2. So wait, is this, uh, is this uh, yes, because, um, so for M equals one, no, sorry, so M starts from one here. Yes, so you start with the point X, it belongs to C hat S, I1, J1, okay? That means that I'm choosing this particular stable state for the first iteration, and then I iterate once, okay? And after one, so I iterate by I1, okay? And then I land in C hat S I2, J2. And then I iterate by I1 plus, so then I iterate by I2, so, I, so it falls in here, and this is C hat S I2, J2, okay? And then I iterate by I2, because this is the stable, the iter that I've chosen for this point, and I land in some other stable state, I3, C hat S I phi J3 and so on. Okay. So this is just if this sequence exists, so if the point X has a hyperbolic sequence, then it stays inside this family of stable slips forever. Okay, so this is a kind of way of defining now the set of points for which this holds. So we now define okay, so you can do the same thing in backward time, you can define forward time and backward time. Um, and we can define CS by definition to be equal to the set of points such that H plus X exists and CU to be the set of points X such that H minus X exists okay and gamma is just equal to CS, CM. So I haven't given the exact definition of the inverse, but it's, it's the same thing. So you, you want to make sure that also in backward time you can make a choice so that you're saying these things all the time. So I claim now, this is just a set, maybe empty, maybe whatever. I claim that this is our rectangle that we want from the theorem. So I'm going to claim that this is a nice, uh, hyperbol hyperbolically recurrent saturated rectangle. So notice that for this, like, for the this, this definition, I've not even used the, the rectangle gamma zero, right? This definition just uses this collection of hyperbolic branches. So I use the rectangle gamma zero and the fact that it's hyperbolically almost recurrent to say that I have a collection of hyperbolic branches. But then all I do is take this collection of hyperbolic branches and just more or less by generalization of the standard horseshoe construction, we find a kind of maximum invariant set as all the points for which you can find some, some combinatorics in some sense, some sequence of uh, iterates at each time that guarantee that you always stay, every time you come back, you stay inside one of these steps. Um, so let me argue, uh, let me try not to get too technical with this and just try to convince you that this should work. Um, so first of all, why should this be 
why should this be a rectangle? I think this should be fairly clear to see, right? So what is so so to show that this is a rectangle, we just need to show that this is a family of full length stable leaves. This is a family of full length unstable leaves, and we just take the intersection. So this should be quite clear why this is just a family of full length stable leaves, right? Because this is just the exact usual uh, horseshoe construction because of the hyperbolicity of these branches, you know that x belongs to this, every time it belongs to a hyperbolic branch, and then it lands in here, and then this line, so um, let me just draw, let me draw this picture. So by assumption, we have that this is the point x, it belongs to some stable state, right? Its image is some unstable state, and then this is f i1, I1 of x, okay? And then by assumption, this belongs to a stable slip. Okay? So we look at this intersection here, and we pull it back, and it gives a smaller slip to which x belongs, right? And then now we take this stable slip, and it will come back another time to some other point here. And by assumption, this also belongs to a stable slip. Okay? And again, we take this intersection. This will be some subset of here. And this will, will give an even smaller slip here. So we get the usual nested family of stable slips converging to zero because you just compose all the hyperbolic branches. Right? So when you do it infinitely many times, you get the shrinking family of, of, of stable slips that are given basically by the composition of the branches. And these converge to just one stable leaf. And you do the same thing backwards. So it should be fairly intuitively clear that this actually gives you a family of stable and unstable leaves, and therefore it gives you a rectangle. This rectangle is nice because these two points are periodic points, um, because it's got the same, the same kind of nice domain. Uh, OK, and we just need to show that it's hyperbolically um, recurrent and that it's saturated. So uh, why is it hyperbolically recurrent? So that's the most difficult part. Um, and I think I will not really try to prove it. I think I will just uh, try to tell you what we need to do. So we need to show. Gamma is hyperbolically and saturated. Remember what I told you is that the difficulty is having these two topics at the same time. And so by this construction, the saturation condition is almost immediate. So let's maybe briefly look at the saturation condition. So the saturation condition says, if you remember that you take your stable strip, you take its image, you take all the stable leaves here, right? You pull them back, so you get a family of Stable of long stable leaves here, and this need to be part of the need to be already inside the construction. But this is kind of obvious uh, from the construction, right? Because we've defined these are the stable leaves of points that have infinite good itinerary and good hyperbolic time. So clearly, if these here, by assumption, have good hyperbolic times, they have this good sequence because from these forever in the future, if they stay inside the maximal invariant set, then obviously. These will also do that because for these, you just take any of these points and they belong to this hyperbolic branch and they map to here, and then from then on, the whole uh, orbit is, is finalized. Okay, so that the the we started with something that where we had some hyperbolic recurrence, but we didn't have saturation, and we did a construction to get a larger rectangle, which is basically automatically saturated. But now we need to prove that this new rectangle is still hyperbolically recurrent because 
we might have added lots of new leaves and we might have uh, new returns, so we do not know that we still preserve the hyperbolic returns. So we need to show that this is still hyperbolic returns, and I will just sketch briefly the, the, uh, the argument, and the argument is in fact that if we have a return time, so now we have our new rectangle, and we have, I always draw it in the same. Okay, so we have x, and then we have the image, So we have x, we have some image f tau, let's say f tau of x, that it comes back to take the first return time, and then we need to show that there's a hyperbolic branch associated to it. So how are we going to be able to show that there's a hyperbolic branch? Well, um, because x is in gamma, and f tau of x is in gamma, so we know that by assumption of the way gamma is defined, we know that they have some hyperbolic branches associated with them. So we know that x belongs to some stable strip because it has to belong to some stable strip uh, given by the symbolic sequence, right? So x, x has some symbolic sequence h of x and uh, f tau of x, y is equal to f tau of x also has some symbolic sequence, h, y. So x belongs to some stable state. f tau of x, y belongs to some unstable state. But we don't know that these two strips are images of one another. That's what we don't know. A priori, uh, uh, they chosen independently. Uh, that's exactly what we have to Choose. We, if these were images of one another, then we'd have a hyperbolic branch that we need, but a priori we don't know. And then the argument is actually uh, geometrically a little bit involved, but again using the niceness of the rectangle, we look at, so this, this hyperbolic branch has some return time uh, i, and this one has some backward return time k, say, or i prime. So we don't know that they're the same, but we know that f tau is the first return time. So we kind of assume by contradiction that i and k must be bigger than tau. If i or k was equal to tau, then this would be the branch, and then i would be equal to k would be equal to tau. Okay? And then using again the kind of niceness of the rectangle, we show that nevertheless, if we take f minus i, now you take this strip and you iterate it by f minus i, you look at the pre-image, under time i, okay, which is, um, sorry, under time tau, okay, which is the first return time, and then it's possible to show that this has to kind of intersect like this. It has to, uh, because this strip here contains f tau of x, so its pre-image under time tau must contain x, and then it's possible to show that uh, the boundaries have to be outside this by a similar argument using the niceness of the rectangle. You cannot have these inside here. Okay, I will not go into the details here. And what does this mean? This means that if we have a uh, unstable, we've lost the thing. So this means that if we have an unstable curve here, then it maps across like this. Okay, all the unstable curves here. And therefore, in particular, this means that there exists some unstable curve associated to a point in gamma zero. So there must be some point in gamma zero that does this, and here there must be some stable curve also associated to some point in gamma zero, okay, which is the original rectangle, because these hyperbolic branches are hyperbolic branches given by the original gamma zero, right? That's, those are the collection of hyperbolic branches that we use to construct this rectangle. So these are hyperbolic branches associated to gamma zero. And so now we show that because these must intersect, when you look at the image, okay, that means that the image of this stable leaf comes back like this. Okay. And that means that we have an almost return of gamma zero to gamma zero. So this means that at time tau, 
we've proved, we've started by assuming that tau is the first eternal time or a point of gamma to gamma, okay? But we showed because of the geometry that actually that implies necessarily that there must be some point of gamma zero that has an almost return at gamma zero at time tau to gamma zero at time tau. And therefore, because it has an almost return by the hyperbolic almost recurrence, we know that there's a hyperbolic branch at time tau, and therefore this has to be exactly that. So we've not only shown that it's hyperbolically recurrent, but in fact, the collection of all the branches given by the actual returns, because this is not hyperbolic almost recurrent, it's recurrent <laughs> rectangle, so every point comes back. This comes from the construction also, that every point has a symbolic dynamic, so every point must come back. And every point has a hyperbolic branch, which is in fact one of the hyperbolic branches given by the original collection of gamma zero. So in fact, these two rectangles, gamma zero and gamma, they have the same collection of hyperbolic branches. That's the crucial point in, uh, in, in this. That's how we managed to, 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 to get the, uh, the hyperbolic recurrence also for that. If we had to try to construct new hyperbolic branches, that's where we were not able to, to do that because to prove that this new rectangle has this property starting from the beginning, we cannot do that. Okay, so we actually show that the collection of hyperbolic branches of the original rectangle are sufficient to give the hyperbolic mechanisms. Okay, so this is a sketch of the argument to show that you can construct, given just a hyperbolically almost recurrent rectangle, we can construct a new one that is hyperbolically recurrent and saturated, and by the argument that we did before, this gives rise to a young town. Okay. So the conclusion is that all we need is a uh, hyperbolically almost recurrent nice rectangle, and we get a young town. It's unique. Uh, that's a good question. No, it's uh, I. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm not completely sure if it's somehow canonical, you know, because of of course the construction starts with a certain gamma zero. If you study with a different gamma zero. I mean, in the end, yes, the construction starting from gamma zero, I would say that gives you you know, completely canonic. There's no odd choices made along the way. It's all defined. Yeah, don't make any choices. So you take all the hyperbolic branches and you construct gamma. Yeah, that's a very uh, tough question to ask anyone. <laughs> um, so the, you know, our purpose was to prove a general statement on the existence of SRB measure under some general non-uniform hyperbolistic conditions. Part of the reason it's formulated in this way is that I wanted also to have a, a theorem that did not require the existence of a non-uniformly hyperbolic set, because in practice it's very easy to take a, it's very difficult to take a set and say, okay, there exists. So, for example, there's Henon-like maps, uh, for instance. They, um, uh, there you have very precise geometric information. 
And I think it might be possible for Henan light maps to show, to construct a rectangle which has this almost hyperbolic recurrence property. And in the end, that's why we really separated that, you know, after you prove from the hyperbolicity, you prove the hyperbolic, the fact that you always have hyperbolic branches. But after that, it's all kind of independent. Most of, most of the results are independent of having the, having the, the, um, the hyperbolic set. So it should be possible that there should be some examples where you can actually uh, show, because of the specific properties of the example, that you have a rectangle with these hyperbolic branches. We've not done that. It's a very good question. It would be good if we could use it in a specific situation. Anyone else wants to ask a question? So maybe I have some. Uh, I'm not so certain of the level of the work for this uh, school, and today it has to go to the yes to prepare for the conference. Next one. <laughs>
Yes, and today I'm the book about this, uh, which is well based on my uh, PhD thesis, which finished like three weeks ago. But all the results were made like three years ago. But anyway. So uh, let me discuss about uh, sums and products of Cantor sums. Uh, here, sums and products means uh, arithmetic sums and arithmetic products. And uh, the motivation is a state of theory, mathematical physics. So I will explain briefly about those. But uh, to understand the problem and what's going on, uh, those motivations are not necessary. OK, so we discuss one-dimensional and two-dimensional quasi-crystal models. And also, we consider spectrum of the Lagrange model, which is a two-dimensional quasi-crystal model. Those are all motivations. And also, uh, this is joint work with uh, Jay Kilman and William Nissen. Uh, we also consider, if we have time, uh, I will talk about the spectrum of three diagonals we are different dimensions. All those are uh, motivations. OK. So uh, let me start with candle set, uh, which I'm sure that everybody is familiar. Uh, if I say Cantor set, then uh, it's always a uh, dimensional Cantor set, uh, and it's compared to the products. And uh, this is the most famous Cantor set in the world. More explanation is necessary, I'm sure. And uh, some then products of Cantor sets. Uh, let me talk about uh, well, motivation. How does they show up? Uh, some of Cantor sets shows up in, uh, in, well, in all the branches of mathematics. For example, uh, it shows up in smooth dynamics. Uh, also, it shows up in number theory. And it also shows up in mathematical physics, and this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. And uh, I will also talk about products of two Cantor sets, and uh, my, one of the main uh, results of mine is about products of two Cantor sets. Uh, this shows up naturally as the state from of the value, which is a two-dimensional quasi crystal. OK, uh, to talk about my results, uh, let me briefly explain about uh, thickness. Uh, for every Cantor set, you can define a value called thickness. Uh, it's a real number, and uh, uh, for let k be a Cantor set, and this is the definition. Well, what's happening? Uh, the definition is this. Uh, well, Cantor sets, it's, well, Cantor sets has uh, boundary many gaps. Uh, let, us, uh, let us pick one pair of gaps, u1 and u2, and assume that uh, u1 gap u1 this size is bigger. Then let us compute this number divided by this number, which is, which is this. And uh, we take, uh, we, uh, and also, uh, if this gap is bigger, then we do, uh, we compute this divided by the size of the smaller gap. And we take in common. We do that for every two set of gaps, and we take in common. So uh, if this value is large, then that means that every two gaps has to be sufficiently apart. So that can also say this kind of thick. So if this value is large, then oh, it's thick. It, it, it measures how thick that can also say. And uh, gap lemma, uh, this is a easy consequence of new, new, new house gap lemma. Uh, what does it say? This says that uh, if we have two Cantor sets, K and L, and if the product of thicknesses is bigger than one, then K plus L is a disjoint union of finitely many closed intervals. But this is known like a uh, of years ago. And uh, some easy probability. Uh, if we add additional properties uh, such that the size of the largest gap of k is not greater than the diameter of l, and vice versa, then uh, k plus l is in fact a closed interval. Uh, this assumption just says that well, k and l has a sufficiently similar size. OK. So. OK, uh, so uh, if the product of thicknesses is greater than 1, uh, sums of two Cantor sets is always, it's always this joint union of finitely many closed intervals. Uh, what about products of two Cantor sets? Uh, for this, uh, it can be well, finitely many closed intervals, intervals, or it can be uh, countably many closed intervals. And in fact, uh, it can be really countably many closed intervals. Uh, this is a Okay. And uh, let me talk about my result. Uh, this is the first result. Uh, let us prepare two capital sets, K and L. And assume uh, that uh, for the time being, uh, left hand side of K and L are both zero. Uh, let us consider products of two capital sets. Then, uh, if this kind of, uh, I forgot to say, but uh, tau K this is the thickness of K, thickness of L. Uh, if this condition or this condition is satisfied, then the product of two capital sets uh, is an interval. And uh, this uh, estimate is, in fact, optimal, uh, the best estimate. And also, if the thicknesses, if those two values are the same, then golden mean shows up. 
Uh, what's the graph? Uh, this is the graph. So we have this bold, bold, bold uh, curves. Uh, if the thickness is above this here in this region, then a product of two tensor sets is always an interval. If two thicknesses, if you pick thickness from here, then it can be whatever. Uh, products of two candle sets can be union of uh, finitely many or close to hmm? finitely many or countably many uh, close to those. Okay, okay uh, let me talk about the uh, idea of the proof uh, briefly. Uh, well, uh, we want to consider products of two candle sets. Uh, we already have results about sums of two candle sets by New House of Lemma. Uh, we want to change products to sum. Um, what can we do? We can just take log, uh, log. If you take log, then, well, it becomes sum of sum of three candle sets. Uh, there are two problems. Uh, one problem is that uh, if one candle set contains the origin, if you take log, this zero goes to negative infinity. This is one problem. And the other much more bigger trouble is that uh, log, if you take log, log, taking log, that operation is nonlinear. So the thickness is not preserved. So, well, it's it's very difficult to obtain optimal state. That's, uh, that's the main problem. Okay, uh, and uh, well, uh, this is a uh, more general result. Uh, if two capital sets uh, contains the origin, and also, uh, uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, this is uh, this. this. And, uh, this is a more general result. Uh, if two capital sets contains the origin, uh, not necessarily the left hand side is zero, just general case. Then uh, this is the optimal estimate. Uh, if two thicknesses satisfy this condition, then a uh, product of two candle sets is an integral. Uh, and well, if the value of the thickness is the same, then uh, silver in shows up. And what's the graph? Uh, this is the graph. Uh, we have a long curve. Uh, if the thickness is there, then product of two candle sets is always an interval, and if thickness, if you pick thickness from here, then whatever we're predicting that. Okay, and let me talk about uh, motivation a little bit. Uh, it's about mathematical physics later on theory, but uh, I, I will try to explain a way that everyone can understand. Uh, first, uh, what's quasi crystal? Quasi crystal is a material which looks like crystal but not completely crystal, that's why it's quasi almost crystal. Quasi crystal. And uh, such crazy material was discovered by this person, Dan Schechman, in 1980s, I think. And he was awarded a Nobel Prize uh, kind of recently in chemistry. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, and uh, uh, mathemat mathematicians' job or physicists' job is to analyze that. Uh, first, we need a model, and this is one model of a two-dimensional quasi-crystal. Uh, it's called Penrose sliding. Uh, this is a uh, well, deterministic rule. This can be created. This uh, tiling can be created, and it's a periodic. It's, if it is deterministic, and it has it has uh, what is it? order. It has order, but it's never it, it never has a translation symmetry. So if you shift, then you can. How, no matter how you shift, uh, it never be never coincide. Okay, so this is one famous model for uh, two-dimensional quantum crystal model, but uh, unfortunately, human being has no technique to analyze this. So, uh, oh, yeah. And uh, this is a Penrose, a standing of a Penrose sliding. And uh, so, uh, two-dimensional quantum crystal model, it's, uh, human being so far has no technique to analyze, so let us consider an easier model. Uh, let us consider one-dimensional quantum quasi-crystal model. Uh, such material does not exist in nature, but who cares? Uh, so, uh, so what's, the, uh, what's the method to create such sequence, or a periodic sequence? Uh, we can create a sequence in this way. I did not explain much, but this is called Sturnian sequence. And if you pick alpha in this way, uh, inverse of golden mean, then uh, that is called a uh, Fibonacci substitution sequence. And this sequence can be constructed in a different way uh, by substitution. Let us consider this substitution rule. Uh, 0 goes to 0, 1, and 1 goes to 0. And uh, if you apply this rule to 0, then well, 0 becomes 0, 1, and this 0 becomes 0, 1, 1 becomes 0, and so on and so forth. You can create one-sided periodic sequence, uh, which is called a Fibonacci substitution sequence. And we use this sequence to model one-dimensional quasi 
Okay, and well, uh, this is complete spectral theory, so let me explain uh, very quickly. Uh, so, uh, it's a Schrodinger operator, a one dimensional Schrodinger operator, which is, uh, which is this. And um, we have zero one sequence, so instead of zero, we use lambda, and one is just one. In this way, we construct a uh, one dimensional aperiodic sequence, and using this aperiodic sequence, we create a Schrodinger operator. And the only thing I want you to remember is that, well, if you have operator, in fact, it's self-adjoint operator, you have uh, the most important quantity, uh, which is called spectrum. Uh, spectrum is just analog of eigenvalues, uh, so it's just a, a kind of eigenvalue. Uh, but it can be uh, infinite, uh, infinite And uh, this uh, spectrum, uh, it's known that it is dynamically defined at most. And why is that? Uh, let me explain that no results. And no results, it's about, it, everything is about hyperbolic dynamics. OK, uh, so it was about spectral theory, but everything can be explained in terms of uh, hyperbolic dynamics, which is surprising. Anyway, uh, all are no results. So uh, let us define uh, a map called trace map by this. Uh, what is known? Well, uh, let us prepare this surface. Uh, if you pick lambda, then this is one surface, and this is this is a picture. So every time we, so for each lambda, this is just two dimensional surface, uh, very smooth. I mean, another thing. And what is known? Uh, this is known. So we have a map T. This T acts on each surface less sub lambda, and that action is hyperbolic. Well, a lot is written, but it's just. That action is hyperbolic, that's all. And uh, all the nice properties, uh, it has all the nice properties. Oh, well, uh, this double should. So this is essentially what's happening. We have, um, we have a surface, S sub lambda, and that action is, uh, action T is hyperbolic. OK, and what else is known? Well, uh, let us prepare a line L sub lambda by this, just, uh, just a line. And it's very easy to see that this line, uh, it's on the surface, S sub lambda. And the spectrum, uh, the most important quantity in uh, spectral theory, can be given by the intersection of the stable manifolds. Uh, the action is hyperbolic, so we have stable manifolds. Intersection of the intersection of the stable manifolds and this line. So this is a picture. So we have stable manifolds and we have line. And here, intersection, end of set, a dynamically defined end of set, uh, that is the spectrum of the uh, shading operator. What is the picture? We have lambda. Uh, for each lambda, we have a surface, this sub lambda. Uh, we also have a line, and the intersection is the spectrum and those things. Okay. okay, and what is, uh, this is also known. Uh, if lambda is almost equal to 1, then thickness of the cantor set, well, uh, spectrum is, uh, this is spectrum. Uh, spectrum is cantor set. We, have, we can define thickness, uh, it's really large. If lambda is really large, then uh, half the dimension of the cantor set is very small. Okay, and uh, well, that was all. Uh, everything was about the uh, one-dimensional quasi-crystal model, uh, but we want to consider well higher dimensional quasi-crystal model. Uh, but uh, when we're studying two-dimensional quasi-crystal model, nothing is known. So let us consider a simpler two-dimensional quasi-crystal model, and they are the simpler models. They are separable. And uh, you can apply the results of uh, one-dimensional models. So if you connect, if you, you can, so we use uh, two copies of one-dimensional model. A uh, one, two, we use two copies. If you connect like this, uh, this model is called square tiling. If you connect diagonally, that is called the length model, which is the model that I consider. Okay. Um, and the, if you consider this model, then the spectrum of this model. Uh, which is given by sums of two spectra of one-dimensional models. Uh, and we already know that both uh, spectra, they are uh, candle sets, dynamically defined candle sets. So the spectrum of this model becomes uh, sums of two candle sets. And if you consider this Lagrange model, then the product, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the spectrum becomes a product of two spectra, spectra which is a product of two candle sets. Uh, that's why uh, I consider the product of two candle sets. Uh, what else is uh, uh, okay? Let me see this. Okay, uh, so this is the reason. Uh, no, 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 I can't see this. Uh, so, so, uh, so this is the uh, square tiling. Uh, this is known. If lambda is uh, really large, then sums of two cantor sets. It's again a cantor set. 
If lambda is very close to one, sums of two capital sets, the spectrum of this is again a middle. And uh, this is about the last that I did. And this problem is uh, in my intermediate regime, nothing is known. It's completely open. And I'm sure that this problem is really easy. OK, and uh, what I got is that you can say something similar for the labyrinth model. Uh, let me remind you that the spectrum of this model is given by product of two spectras, so product of two candle sets. Uh, so this just says that if uh, two coupling constants, if these two values are very close to one, then well, uh, spectrum is, is again in the So the analog of this result holds. OK. Uh, I, I have two minutes. Um, uh, uh, okay, let, let, let me explain uh, one minute. So uh, this is another result, um, but let me, so let me explain a little bit. So this is another one-dimensional model. Uh, the only difference is that we have this term. So well, the, so the only thing I wanted to remember is that this operator depends on gamma, and this gamma has two parts that the end that's all. And uh, it is already known that uh, the spectrum of this model, this one-dimensional quasi-crystal model, it's, uh, the spectrum is ten thousand. This is already known. And uh, this is a picture. So in the case of, if this Q is equal to zero, then that's the previous case. And in that case, uh, well, we have sub lambdas, and the line is on the surface. But if Q is not equal to zero, then <coughs> this line is not on the surface. So you have to consider all those lambdas simultaneously, and these uh, stable, mi stable manifolds, we have natural continuation. In fact, everything is analytic, very smooth. And here, this intersection becomes a spectrum. So it is not dynamically defined, but it has some similar properties, and well, all these things are for you. OK, I will finish in 20 seconds. OK, and let us consider a two-dimensional quasi-crystal model using those, those one-dimensional models. What will happen? Again, the sums, uh, again, the spectrum is given by sums of two spectra, again, sums of two candle sets, but this time it's not dynamically defined, and this is what we prove. Uh, there exists a region, parameter region, such that uh, if you consider, if you pick uh, parameters from that region, then the spectrum of that model is interval cantor mix. Such that it means that it just contains interval and both, well, it contains both interval and cantor. And this is a first example, of first two-dimensional quasi-crystal model, which has this properties, and this is what we did. Uh, I mentioned the dynamical system F. 
where if you find on a, a torus, and I mentioned a torus, and here you think of n as being a fixed number but very large. And now how this uh, system is defined in the following way. So you suppose that you have n expanding identical maps f, and you should think of them as sitting on each node of this uh, network here. So you should think that you have a copy of torus on each of these nodes, and if there were no connections in the network, so everything was uncoupled, each of these coordinates would evolve according to some uniform expanding maps. Then you couple these maps uh, on this uh, structure, meaning that the equation, so you have a discrete dynamical system, and the evolution of the coordinate on this node here will depend on the coordinate of the nodes, so the, the coordinates associated to the node, and also the coordinates associated to the nodes to which this node here is connected. And the point, uh, so the heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous uh, part comes in the structure of the network, where you can uh, basically divide the nodes in two subsets, the club nodes, which are the one that makes a huge number of connections, so you should think of them as connected to many other nodes in the network. But then you have uh, most of the nodes of the network which are actually low degree nodes, so nodes that make a small number, a small number of connections. And more precisely, the equations for uh, the discrete time dynamical system is the following. So for every i uh, in the set of level nodes of the graph, the evolution uh, at time t plus 1 depends on the uh, coordinates at time t in the following way. So we apply the uh, a hyperbolic, let's say, uniform expanding map f, and then you add the interaction. And you add the interaction uh, which are given by a coupling function h, a coupling strength alpha, and uh, of course interactions so are selected by uh, these numbers, uh, which are either zeros or ones. So you have an interaction between the coordinate n and the coordinate i wherever uh, a i n is equal to 1. You don't have the interaction when it's 0. And this is a, a, basically defines a matrix which is associated to the network and basically uh, selects which edges are present uh, or not in the network. Here there is this rescaling of the coupling strength by delta. Delta is the maximum degree uh, in the network. That means that's the maximum number of connections that the node in the network needs. This means that if a node is uh, highly connected, the sum here will have roughly, let's say, delta, delta turns. So this is an order one perturbation for the map f. Instead, if the uh, node is a low degree node, so it has a very small number of connections, the number of uh, uh, turns here in this sum is much smaller than delta. And this means that this interaction term is very small, and it's a small perturbation for, for the map some examples, easy examples, are the star network, where you have lots of low degree nodes and just one hub, and all the low degree nodes feed some interaction to the hub, but not vice versa. So this is a strip product, actually. And then another very easy example, another, another uh, almost trivial example, is, uh, is the one where you uh, delete the arrows. And so this means that not only the low degree nodes are influencing the hub, but also the hub is influencing them. So there is a feed there in this strip product. And even this looks, let's say, as a very easy example, I mean, it's very easy to describe, it's much less trivial to treat uh, with. Uh, so these are the equations in this case. Now, yeah? In the previous example, the second iterate, uh, Yeah, that's precisely. So the, the point of this uh, heterogeneous network is that the diameter of the network is very small. So in order for a node to feel the influence of another node, it takes very few steps, like uh, here in this case it's two steps for every node to feed the influence of every node. And of course since the uh, local maps on each of the nodes is uh, chaotic, this uniform expanding is, is uh, spoils things. So a more general uh, case one can treat is the case of layered network where you have your layer of low degree nodes and then you have different layer, layers of up nodes where basically they, have, they share the same order uh, of the degrees. So they all are proportional, they are all fractions, finite fractions, I mean, the fraction between 0 and 1 uh, of, the, of the maximum degree delta. And so you suppose that you don't have many of them, so the number of hubs uh, grows only logarithmically with the, with the size of the network. Then you have some conditions on the uh, degree of the low degree nodes, and, and you should have the, the maximum degree on your net, in your network uh, is sufficiently large, so it grows sufficiently fast with the size of the network. Then under this hypothesis, you can define for every hub node, so for every uh, highly connected node, you can define the map GJ, which is given by the upper tube map F, plus some average interaction that's coming from uh, the rest of the network. 
the average interaction is uh, let's say alpha, which was the, the uh, unscaled uh, coupling, coupling strand, and kappa j is, was the fraction of uh, the maximum number of connections that the hub uh, was making. And then you have this interval, which is done with respect to the back measure here. Uh, if you suppose, for example, that the back measure is the important measure for the hub, yeah? but here you should think of that in, uh, uh, the measure for you, you can think of that as being the important measure for the so somehow we are seeing that the statistical behavior of the uncoupled building we know is the one that determines this map. So it was the one that determines an average, uh, an average interaction. And so we want to, I mean, what we prove is that this map here uh, gives an approximation for the evolution of your hub. And this is, is a map that depends on the uh, hub coordinates only. So basically what we claim is that we can uh, find uh, a, a, an average evolution for the hub nodes that doesn't depend on the uh, very large number of coordinates that, that you have in your system, but it depends only on the coordinates of the hub. Of course, there is some, uh, some price to pay, and this is a fluctuation term. And so what we can do is to uh, control this fluctuation term. And so under some hypothesis, so in particular, uh, that this map, and the hypothesis that this map is a hyperbolic map, uh, for each hub j, you have the, the dynamics of the hub j is given by the reduced map, so the low dimensional approximation, plus fluctuations, which are controlled, so they are below uh, any fixed threshold psi, for a large set of initial conditions, and for where large means that the, the measure of this initial condition is almost one, depending on the size of the network, and for a time which is exponentially large on delta, on the degree of the moon. So if you want the maximum degree in the so if you suppose that you have fixed your threshold size for, for the uh, fluctuation and you let the size of your network tend to infinity, this means that the, this map here will give you the description of the hub dynamics for extremely long time. But in, in here, so for example, for maps, uh, for sorry, for networks uh, with a number of nodes of order of 10 to the, to the fifth, I mean, this time here is so large that you will never observe anything but this map in, in your simulation. For time in America, in America. Uh, an example of applications is the case where uh, f is the Dublin map and, and you have this difference of sign as a coupling function. So you can do the computation and you can find out what's the expression for the map gj that gives you the approximation for the hub dynamics. And these are just some graphs for different values of the parameter alpha times kappa j. And this is the bifurcation diagram for, for this map. So basically what this is telling you is that if you have if you're given an network, you're given with these particular parameters and you're given alpha and you're given kappa j, you can go in this bifurcation diagram, you can select the particular parameters that you have, and this can give you the behavior of your hub, basically. And here, so for example, if you're here, you can observe uh, expanded behavior, you can observe some approximate uh, these points. Uh, yes, so here are numerical simulations where uh, the solid line is the uh, graph of is the graph of the map G, so it's the, the one-dimensional approximation, and the red dots are the, the simulated point. And so, as you can see, uh, all these uh, points accumulate in this here in, for these particular values of the connectivity and of the coupling strength. There is a attractive period of orbit of period two, and so you see that all the orbits is accumulating on this point. For this other value of the parameter, you have an attractive fixed point, and so what you observe is that the orbit of, uh, of, uh, of the hub is, uh, is concentrated on uh, that fixed point. And, and here, let's say, I mean, this is showing you that the approximation is actually quite good, and now I, I, I didn't put it on the slide, but if you increase the size of the network, this is, has been done for a size of the network uh, 10 to the power 5, and if you increase the size of the network, what you observe is that this red cloud is shrinking. Towards the three of coordinates or the orbit. And yeah, this has, let's say, some consequence also for, for applications and for what, uh, let's say, is the behavior of uh, dynamics on uh, of, uh, maps of systems coming to networks. So, in particular, uh, for example, what this is show, showing us is that these two hubs here, for which that's the, the, the simulated orbit, which shows synchronization. Because since the reduced dynamics for this hub is an attractive fixed point, what we're going to observe is that both orbits of both these hubs is going to converge towards the fixed point and is sitting around this fixed point, even if there are some uh, small fluctuations 
And if the fluctuations, let's say, are smaller than the precision uh, that you might think of having in a physical experiment, what, what this means is, uh, is that the data that are synchronized because they're, they're, they're coordinate is uh, easy. And this is synchronization that is not due to mutual interruption, so it's not due to the presence of some stable direction uh, that connects the two coordinates, but it's just due to the uh, overall interruption that's coming, the common interruption that's coming from uh, the reservoir. Uh, yes, about just about the comment about the hypothesis on the ergodicity of the uh, reduced map. So this is uh, one thing show that it's generic. Uh, I mean, it's a consequence of the uh, juristic of ergodicity in dimension one that this condition is actually generic. And one can say more. One can say that for uh, there is an uh, open and dense set of coupling function for which uh, there is an interval such that the, if the coupling strength is tuned so that alpha times the connectivity is inside this interval, the map has a finite number of periodic hyperbolic attractor. So synchronization uh, is observed uh, generically uh, if one is able to tune uh, the graph. Uh, just a glimpse of uh, what's needed to prove uh, this type of uh, result. So, uh, in a trivial case, so the case of a skew product, what you have is that uh, you have a bunch of nodes, most of the nodes are linear network, which are actually evolving as a, a, a uniform expanding map, let's say the Dabby map, so you know everything about the evolution of this point. What you know about the half node, for example, in the star network where you have just one half node, is that this is evolving according to the Dabby map plus the interactions. And here, for this very easy example, so you can uh, basically, uh, let's say, separate the part that depends only on the uh, half coordinate and the parts that depend on the rest. And here you have an average. This is an empirical average of the interaction that's coming from the base of the skew product. Okay? And, and here you can see the reduced dynamics. So this is the low dimensional approximation. And so what, what one has to control is this uh, empirical average. So if you fix a threshold of epsilon, uh, one wants to study the set where the fluctuations are above the threshold, because this is where the, let's say, the low-dimensional approximation is going to break. But then you have uh, uh, large deviation estimates, so concentration of measure, uh, results on concentration of measures, that tells you that the Lebesgue measure of this set is less or equal than exponential, uh, some constant c times epsilon squared times l. So as before, as I was saying before, uh, whenever excitement is a fixed threshold, you let L increase, and this gives you a, a set of very, very small size. And since the size is very small, what you know is that uh, since, since the leg measure is a god, for example, for this system is amazing, it's whatever you want, you will eat this set uh, with, 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 I mean, quite rarely. But you will eventually eat it, because this is a set of positive measure, so this is telling you that even if uh, it's very rare that these fluctuations are large, they, they will be eventually uh, uh, Yeah. What are the challenges uh, when you are not dealing with a skew product system? Well, there are some challenges. One, one is what you just said, so is that it takes uh, very little time before uh, one coordinate feels the influence of any other coordinate. Uh, another challenge is the, the perturbation is depending on L. So if you want to treat this term as a smooth perturbation, you need L to increase. So you need to increase this, uh, the dimensionality of your dynamical system. So this is a non-standard perturbation uh, argument that one has to, uh, to apply. Uh, then, of course, related to this is that if you increase the, uh, the dimension L, also nonlinearity is increased because there is a product. And, uh, I mean, uh, your, basically your space is uh, becoming less and less compact. It's always compact for finite L, but it becoming, uh, the diameter of your space is uh, increasing. And, and in general, yeah, your fluctuation will be, will be large. So you cannot treat, uh, let's say, this term here as a smooth perturbation to your system. So in general, this map will never be, so this map, there is no reason to, to, to think it's uh, uniform and polypro uh, so what, what do we do then to deal with these problems uh, is this is our, let's say, original map. What we produce, we produce an auxiliary map that we call the truncated map, which artificially uh, cuts uh, off the fluctuations. 
So you define this new map in such a way that it's equal to the original map whenever the fluctuations with respect to the low dimensional approximation is below the given threshold epsilon, and then you, you modify it whenever these fluctuations are, are too large. Uh, and you modify it in a controlled way. This means that as long as the fluctuations are below the threshold, the map f epsilon gives you uh, the same orbits of the original map f. Whenever you enter the set where the fluctuations are large, your map doesn't describe uh, your system anymore. But let's say you are happy if this happens uh, sufficient uh, for, for, for time sufficient to large. And this is what, uh, what we do. Uh, and the, the steps of the proof are uh, very quickly the following. So if your reduced map are hyperbolic, what you can show is that for epsilon sufficient small, your auxiliary map, your truncated map, has a spoon as a cone splitting, a uniform cone splitting, so the map is uniform every point. And you can describe uh, the periodic attractors of, uh, well, you can describe the, 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 attractor or the attractors of this map from the knowledge of the periodic attractor for the reduced map. And so what you get is, uh, is uh, some uh, non invertible solenoids uh, which supports uh, physical SRP measures in your system. And what you have to show then is that the set uh, the epsilon where fluctuations were large. You know already that this was more with respect to the uh, reference measure that you take, which was the product measure of the uncoupled of the uncoupled systems. You have to show that this set has measured more also for the invariant measure of the map of the epsilon. And this uh, requires a global argument. You cannot uh, argue uh, locally. And and so uh, so we, we found that the uh, so the main challenge to overcome is, again, the dependence on the dimension. And we found the dramatic approach useful here in this case because it lets us control very well the evolution of the densities, and in particular the dependence on, uh, on the dimension, and so the propagation of the linearities in this case. And so we are able to prove, in fact, that the, the size of this set is still exponentially small, also for the invariant measure of the map f epsilon. So this means that any orbit uh, for f epsilon uh, from a very large set will take a uh, very long time to hit the set uh, E epsilon. But since outside E epsilon, F and F epsilon are the same map, this allows us to conclude for the map that for the region of map. And I think I will stop here. Here is some future work and uh, general vision. start to jump from one layer to another. So if your hub nodes uh, change the connectivity so that also the, I mean the, the attractor or the attractors of your reduced map change, then uh, it becomes quite hard to, to do anything. Uh, but if uh, they remain, so if the number of connections remain inside certain range, then everything.
started to think if this weaker notion of hyperbolicity is generic or not. And it occurred that it is not generic, which was proven by Gorodetsky, Lyashenko, Plessin, and Lansky in 2005. And uh, by proving this theorem, they introduced also uh, some special kind of measures, uh, which I called royal measures. And I don't want to present the formal definition of it because it is quite technical. But uh, let me just make a picture and where put my hands a little bit. So a royal measure is just a weak start limit of uh, a sequence of measures which are supported uh, at periodic orbits. Uh, but this sequence has to be uh, chosen in a special way. That is, the first periodic orbit is, let's say, arbitrary. The second orbit has to shadow this first orbit many times. After that, we are allowed to go somewhere else in our space. And after that, we come back and we close the trajectory. And then we trip the second orbit as the base one, and we repeat our procedure. So the third orbit will be shadowed the second one. After that, it will come uh, something far, and it will come back to its initial position, and so on. So every, uh, every such an orbit is a support of a periodic measure, and then we take a weak star limit of, of these measures, and this measure is royal. And because most of the time, all, the, all of these orbits actually are more or less in the same uh, place in our space, uh, one can control some properties of the royal measures. For example, one can show that they are ergodic. But because every of uh, this orbit is allowed to come somewhere else, one can control the value of the Lyapunov exponent of these measures. So one can uh, also construct it in such a way that uh, one of the Lyapunov exponents will be equal to zero. So we will obtain non-hyperbolic measure. But uh, what wasn't known about this measure is what is the entropy of a royal measure. Does it uh, have to be equal to zero or not? During this talk, I, I will try to answer the question. But to do that, I need the notion of the Feldman Catholic supermetry, which is an analog of the uh, F bar supermetry, which is defined in the context of uh, the symbolic dynamics. And it was introduced by Feldman and independently by Cato. So uh, we translate, translated this notion to the setting of a compact metric space, uh, x rho, and we have t, which is a homeomorphism of the space. Actually, it also can just continue to matter. Everything works similarly. And first, we define the pseudometric for two sequences with elements in our space. Here is the formal definition, but maybe again I will make a picture. So, we have two sequences, Z, and uh, X. Z and uh, 
from the initial segment of the sequence X have to be removed so that we will can find an order preserving bijection uh, of the uh, rest uh, which satisfies the following property. The distance between an element of its image is smaller than delta. Okay? So, so in our case, we, we say that f by delta, I don't know what is delta here, uh, xz is equal to uh, 1 over uh, 6. Yes, because uh, I cut it from 0, so let's say 6. And after that, uh, we define f delta of xz to be the upper limit of f and delta. And the uh, Pelma kind of pseudomatic uh, between two sequences is equal to the infimum over all positive deltas, such that f delta of xz is smaller than delta. And if we have uh, the definition for sequences, we can also uh, define the uh, distance between two points by saying that this is equal to the uh, distance between the trajectories. Okay, so uh, it occurs that the convergence with respect to uh, upper pseudometry or permutative pseudometry uh, has many interesting properties. So we assume that now that uh, we have a, a sequence of points, uh, every of points from the sequence is generic for an ergodic measure. And we assume that this sequence is a purpose. Uh, then, in general, there is no reason uh, for, for the uh, space X equipped with the upper metric to be a complete space. But uh, we can find a quasi orbit, uh, which is a limit of such a sequence. By a quasi orbit, I mean, well, uh, I mean that the upper asymptotic uh, density, the same which appears today, tomorrow, uh, today, uh, of the set of j such that xj plus 1 is different to t of xj, this is equal to 0. So the pseudo orbit is. Uh, uh, built from longer and longer pieces of orbits. And, well, if our system satisfies some specification property or reach uh, asymptotic shadowing property or something like that, then we can just uh, shadow this quasi orbit by a normal orbit, and then we uh, will obtain that our space is complete. But even if our system does not satisfy specification property, uh, then the existence of this quasi-orbit is enough to show that uh, the sequence mu j uh, is uh, converging with respect to the weak star topology to some ergodic measure. Uh, this uh, quasi-orbit is generic for this, uh, for this ergodic measure. Moreover, we have lower semi continuity of the entropy. Uh, the interesting thing is that, there, uh, that the entropy function is lower semi continuous but not upper semi continuous. One can, uh, one can uh, show a counter example of the upper semi continuity. So, this is clearly not true when we. Uh, Lower semi continuity is not true uh, if we uh, work with, uh, with star topology. And also, it will assume that all points from our system is, uh, are periodic points. Uh, 
then we obtain that mu is a loosely complementary measure uh, that it's, it belongs to the uh, same class uh, as a gothic rotation of a compact uh, finite topological group with respect to the Kakutani relation. So Kakutani relation is uh, a natural uh, a relation on uh, ergodic dynamical systems which is weaker than uh, isomorphic relation uh, in the sense that uh, if two systems are isomorphic then, have to be, then they have to be equivalent with respect to the Kakutani relation but not vice versa. And we also show that royal measures which uh, uh, are as I said before, the weak star limit of some periodic measures are also uh, limits with respect to this spellman cover pseudomet. And because of that, we can apply the results from the previous slide to this royal uh, measures, and we get that royal measures are loosely chronicled, in particular, they have to have uh, zero entropy, or if you would like uh, only, only this entropy result, you can just look as at, uh, at this dot because every periodic measure clearly has zero entropy, so so also this has to be zero. And